So this time yeah, hold on. Hey, buddy, we'll just come back and share. there um, in the world, particularly Liberia, and those of our colleagues here in the U.S. Uh, my name is Volcano Shelton. I will be moderating this uh, wonderful occasion. And this is the Association of Liberian Journalists in the Americas, ALJA, 21st National Convention held here in the city of Trenton, the state of New Jersey, the USA. Today is our hybrid media workshop. We want to 
uh, quickly apologize to all of you, our viewers and listeners, wherever you are in the world, uh, for coming on a little late. And it's all due to technology because we're going virtual and sometimes our gadgets have a way of uh, playing with us. So uh, we're hoping that we will now uh, go into this uh, session and hopefully we will have no glitch. But in the meantime, I want to thank the KMTV family and all other media institutions uh, carrying this very live uh, occasion. Uh, we want to also congratulate uh, folks in Liberia, our colleagues, the journalists out there at the I campus up on Kerry Street for finding time in your schedule to come out and uh, be a part of this occasion. Again, we say welcome to all of you. Uh, our Liberian facilitator is Frank Simwala, my former colleague at LBS. Uh, Frank has uh, been very generous to serve in this capacity. So we want to say welcome. Uh, to the leadership of Alja here in America, Mr. Joe Mason, who is the president and his uh, team uh, for doing a very wonderful job to put this whole occasion together. So again, we say welcome to everyone. Frank, if you can hear me out there in uh, Monrovia, uh, I want, Frank, can you hear me? Frank, can you hear me? If you can hear me, Frank, I, I want to turn it over to you to give a little summary of what's happening there so we can begin with our first presentation. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. You can hear me, Bertana? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, we, we're trying to set up in Monrovia. I'm sorry for the echo. Can you hear me now, Volcano? Yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, we're in Monrovia and uh, all is almost set to begin this uh, virtual workshop from uh, Monrovia, the windy city of Monrovia. And we have in the gathering a uh, cross section of journalists, including the president of the Press Union of Liberia, uh, the head of uh, the Center for Media Studies, reporters uh, from both the online broadcast and print media are also present. And uh, we hope that today's uh, deliberation will be fruitful as we wait to listen to the presentations from the experts. Uh, some of them journalism lecturers in the States. And then uh, we intend to also pose some questions to them from the audience here and also look, so, look at some African case studies and also studies uh, relating to what's happening in the media, uh, the internet, the new media in the United States and other parts. What is, what is the momentum so far regarding the audience? Well, uh, <laughs> the, the, the audience here is uh, eager to hear some of the presentations and to also interact with the presenters and also cite some of their own examples of, uh, because as, as I was giving, uh, we'll be looking at new media technology and digital reporting, media ethics, fake news in the age of the internet. And you know, Liberia's uh, online presence it's increasing by the day. We have a number of, uh, countless number of television, online TV, and some of the personnel from those entities are also present, including broadcast uh, personnel as well. Thank you, Frank. Uh, I just also want to quickly acknowledge before we move to our first presenter, uh, Charles Crawford, our Asian representative in Liberia, also Mark home Joseph, who's always been there with us. And, uh, Emmanuel, who's behind the scene helping out, and KMTV in particular for uh, making this possible for us to have this interaction. Um, time is far spent, so we'll go to our first presenter. Uh, just before that, I'd like to, you know, just talk a little bit about her. Her name is Kim Pearson. She's an associate professor or, or professor rather, of journalism 
at the College of New Jersey, who teaches a range of courses, including media entrepreneurship, fact checking and race, gender and the news. She is also a co-founder of TCNJ's uh, interactive multimedia department. Her journals have been published in the online journalism review, um, Black Enterprise and Newsday, among other outlets. Um, she has been part of teams whose research on improving science literacy and civic engagement has garnered support from the National Science Foundation, Microsoft Research and the New Jersey Council of the Humanities. Piercing is the past recipient of the New Jersey uh, Professor of the Year Award from the Carnegie Foundation and the Council for the Advancement and Support for Education. Her professional affiliations include the online use um, association, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, uh, uh, her fraternal, and the National Association of, of Black Journalists. Um, we'll now go to our first presenter, and this is by way of a recording. So uh, stand by. Good morning. My name is Kim Pearson, Associate Professor of Journalism at the College of New Jersey. I'm very sorry that I'm not with you in person right now, but I'm teaching class this morning. So I hope you will forgive me for appearing in this virtual format. I'm so excited to participate in the convention of the Association of Liberian Journalists in the Americas. And with that, I'm going to share my screen and briefly share some slides and resources with you. I've entitled this presentation, Building Community by Meeting, Meeting Community Information Needs, because I think that that's absolutely imperative for the journalism business uh, these days for two reasons. First of all, it's imperative because of the low level of trust that so many people have about the work of journalists and frankly the confusion that people have about what constitutes journalism anymore and journalism's relationship to the truth and second it's important because it's important to the bottom line uh, if journalism is going to be sustainable then it needs to demonstrate its utility to the people whom we hope will support it and you can't do that unless you understand what the community needs. Before I get into the just meat of my presentation, I want to thank uh, the organizers and particularly DeConte Jackson for inviting me to participate in this in this wonderful event. And I want to acknowledge uh, my institution's connections to Liberia. In addition to DeConte, De we have uh, two other, at least two other Liberian American alumni that I know of, uh, Magdala Cooper, the philanthropist and uh, educator, and uh, Will Casa, who is a, a phenomenal artist who is gaining uh, national and international recognition. And uh, for many years, we were privileged to have Dr. Amelia Blyden on our campus. Uh, Dr. Blyden, uh, taught in our School of Education, and she was married to Edward Wilmot Blyden III, uh, who's, uh, and the Blyden family's importance in terms of uh, Liberian history is well known. I want to, uh, first of all, start off with a disclaimer. I'm not an expert on Liberia, and I'm not an expert on Liberian media. I, I have, however, uh, done some reading and some study and uh, you know, and I've noticed a couple of things that I can certainly relate to as an African American woman uh, as a journalist and one of them is the challenge of controlling your own narrative and uh, having to confront the ways in which others represent you 
And I'm, I'm struck, I was struck by two quotes as I pre prepared for this, uh, two quotes that are more than 100 years apart. And the first is from Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, who was a bishop in the African, American, African Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, important part of it. I want to start, first of all, start with my thoughts for my video. I have a lot of done some of the things. You know, I have noticed a couple of things that I can sort of notice that I'm not seeing that at the moment as a journalist. One of them is the challenge of controlling your own mind and having to confront the ways in which others represent you. And I'm, I'm struck by two points that I'm going to give for this. Two points that are more.
All right, guys. Um, we had a little bit of buffering from from our end here, and again, we have no control over some of the circumstances regarding technology. But this time, we would like to go to a live presentation. Hopefully, that will go well. And um, I, I can see Frank. Frank, you're following, right? Just give me a head nod. Good. Good. All right. So um, let me quickly introduce our next. Uh, speaker, Mr. Kenneth Miles. He is the founder of the Trenton Journal, a veteran journalist and the founding partner of Third Space, a boutique co-working space in Newark, New Jersey. Miles' work has appeared in the New York Times Syndicate uh, interview. Uh, he's done interview like um, Enterprise Industry Paper, The Source, and WBGO.org. Mr. Miles holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Broadcast Journalism from Bloomfield College and mentors students from the Young Entrepreneurs Academy in Newark. Miles is currently working on his memoir and resides in Trenton with his family. Ladies and gentlemen, our viewers, our audience, let's welcome Mr. Kenneth Miles, as he presents to us. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Um, someone just said, are you ready? It looks like that you're going to have to speak earlier than expected. So I'm just like, I was told when I was school to always be ready. So um, first of all, let me just start off by saying um, thank you to Kanti and So she asked me to speak about news gathering in the age of social media. And I'm like, I think I can do that. So um, let, me, let me give you a little background about myself. Uh, I've been a journalist for over 26 years. Um, I'm a father. I live in Trenton, New Jersey, and I am the founder and editor of the Trenton Journal. I created the Trenton Journal because when I moved to Trenton, I had a lot of questions. Where to go to get good food? That's one of them. I like to eat. I wanted to know good schools to go to for my daughter. I wanted to know what neighborhoods were safe. I wanted to know, I wanted a place, I wanted, I wanted to, to get a sense of community. And the information where I looked, I looked, looked online, obviously, right? And a lot of what I found out about the Trenton, the Trenton area had to do with a lot of crime and grime. But I know that there's more to a community than just a, those headlines. So um, when I moved into the section where I live at right now, I live in Mill Hill, um, I knocked on doors and you know I, I wanted to get a sense of what it was like to, to live in Trenton. And um, I got involved because I just didn't want to live here. I wanted to be invested in Trenton. So I say all that to say that has something to do with news gathering. And that's how I started news gathering. I was just looking around my neighborhood, what was going on, looking around my churches, seeing what people needed. That's really important. Now, we're all here, but let me tell you how important news is. News is very important. It's critical. You know, um, I just was a manager for a grant out in Newark, where we gave $10,000 each to five individuals to help fill in the information gaps. It's called the North Peer Learning, Learning Grant. And working on that grant actually inspired me to start the Trenton Journal. I'm like, if I can do that to help the people in North, I could do that in my city of Trenton. So I started it, um, and I'll just let me, let me bring it back. So. I started at a very early age when I was 15 years old writing for a newspaper called the Jersey Journal. And I started news gathering. Again, like I said, just looking around what was going on in my school, my neighborhood. 
figuring out what people need. Fast forward now, the Trenton Journal, this is something that I'm very proud of. Uh, log on at www.trentonjournal.com. We need subscribers. Let us know how we are doing. Let me know what you would like to see. And that's a part of news gathering too, because I can sit all day at home writing articles and putting up posts of what I think people are interested in reading or what they want to hear. But what's really important is going out and going out into the community, asking people, what do you need? Right? Because this is not about me, this is about the community. And I'm finding, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, we, I just recently wrote an article. Uh, I interviewed the director of the, part, the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, Dr. Lopez. And that was our most read article. And I'm like, wow, you know, I was surprised with people. They want information about the coronavirus, right? They want information that's going to keep their keep them safe. They want to keep their family safe. They want to go back out. They want to go back to work. They want to gather. They want to go to church and everything else. So they want to, they want to, they want to have factual information. This is why it's so important to not just get news by rumors, but you want to make sure that you have accurate information. And that's why I do what I do. The Trenton Journal, what we do is, and I, I need to emphasize this, because I started by myself. I pride myself on original reporting. I'm not just, I'm not just releasing press releases. I'm, I'm going out into the community, finding out what people need, which is a part of news gathering. Right? I'm going to events, I'm meeting people. A part of this is one of the reasons why I'm here right now, just to introduce myself, let you know what it is that I'm doing and who I am. And for you know other journalists, you know you just can't hide behind your computer. You need to go out and you need to develop develop relationships. And I and I will say, um, from someone who started back in newspapers, I see that's a big difference. You know, um, people think that they can just go on Instagram or Facebook and just report. But if but in order to, to truly get news that's not being reported, you need to be trusted. How do you how do you be trusted? People need to know that you're invested within the community. People want to know that you care about them. People want to know that um, you're sincere in um, what you're doing. You know what I mean? So that's one of the reasons why I continue to do what I do. Um, so we've written we've written articles and produced content in regards to COVID-19, how to get tested. Um, if you wanted to get vaccine, uh, vaccinated, I provided that information for our readers, which is something that's really important. You know, who doesn't like money? I like money, right? You know, it's, it's important to know how to, how to make money, how to find employment, how to keep your friends and your family and your community safe. Um, I, I, I want to hear from you. Like, if, if you have any questions about news gathering, um, I, I tend to work really good at interacting with people. So it's not just about me sitting here talking about what what I do. I wanted to, you know, I'm also going to turn it on to you just to let you know if, to see if you have any questions for me that I can answer when when it comes to gathering news in the, in the uh, the age of social media. Does anybody have any questions right now? So, I So, I'm a little bit curious about in the age of digital technology where anyone can take uh, a brother's voice, a doctor, right? Make it sound like Joe Biden. Uh, and that was posted on social media. How, how do you evaluate the source on social media if you're using a social, social media post, you know? Uh, because anyone can create a fake Twitter account, a Facebook account, a Facebook right. picture. So can you talk a little bit about your experience really uh, involved in different sources of social media? That's that's a really good question. So 
aside from me being a writer and a journalist, I also spent a very long time as a fact checker for a health magazine out in New York. Now, if you don't have your fact street as a journalist before you go reporting information as fact, you can, you can get sued. You, you can get in a lot of trouble um, if, if you don't have your fact street. But uh, to answer your question, you have to verify your sources and make sure that your sources are trusted. Um, I will give you an example just recently. I'm not sure if you know of a woman by the name of Sarah Dash, who is a popular singer, uh, was a popular singer uh, in the 70s, uh, 60s and 70s. She uh, toured and, and sung with Patti LaBelle. She just recently passed. And I was scheduled to do an interview with her in September. And I get a text message in my house saying, breaking news, Sarah Dash just passed away. Can I break the obituary? I want to be first. I want, I want eyeballs on my website, but I wanted to make sure that this was true. So my first question was, how do you know? And who told you? So she told me that she went on uh, Wikipedia and uh, she found out from there. That still wasn't reliable for me because as you may know, anyone could post information on, on Wikipedia. So I, you know, um, I did some digging around myself. And you know what I did ultimately? I had Sarah Dash phone number. So I called, you know, it may seem, you don't see my, but I'm like, let me find out if, if this is true. So I called the number, gentleman picked up, sounded um, somber. And I said, is it true? He said, yes, it is. And then I proceeded to uh, make an announcement from there. So you have to verify your sources because you can find yourself in a lot of trouble, not only financially, because you can get sued if you, uh, if you do not have your facts straight, but you, uh, but you also got to think about credibility. If you're known for reporting misinformation, people are not going to rely on you. So I hope I was able to answer your question in some way. Um, you, you, have to, you have to verify your sources, um, make, make sure, sure that, that they're credible. Um, not every time, you're not always going to have, uh, you're not always going to be able to, to, to go to big publications or verify sources. Even if it's knocking on your door, call them, double checking, testing on your information. Thank you, Kenneth. You're welcome. Uh, we want to go to a room that we will come back to you uh, because the folks in, in, in Liberia, uh, I believe, have questions. Frank, uh, is there anyone in the audience willing to engage uh, Mr. Miles? Frank, can you unmute and uh, uh, you have to unmute? Can you hear you? There you go. There you go. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm afraid the audio wasn't too clear. I don't know how many managed to follow the presentation. But, but I can just put this issue quickly to him. I don't know whether he can follow. Uh, the presentation, but there's this big issue of fake news in recent weeks. Uh, looking at the story of the press release that purportedly came from Walmart, uh, from this news agency that unfortunately was picked up by the world's leading media, including American media agencies, about Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency issue. And then after a short while, more and I a clarification. Uh, you know, my question to you is that what do you think serious traditional media institutions online now uh, can do to put in some corrective measures to avoid such a glitch? Because if you notice, because of that press release, uh, it had an effect on the stock market. Uh, overnight, things changed uh, 360 degrees. So what kind of mechanism can 
news media put in place to avoid such a repeat of what happened. I think it was around September 15th. Okay, I heard big news. Yeah, I heard big news. And uh, uh, media institutions put in place uh, to kind of cover uh, big news or uh, making sure that uh, what they report is factual, especially when it comes to social media. Are there, are there systems that media outlets can put in place? Yes, exactly. Are, yeah. Uh, because, well, there, it's, it's called fact checking. Yeah, fact checking departments. Uh, but let me tell you the thing now from when I started in magazines and newspapers where you would get your news, it would come out the next day. Or, you know, if you go to that radio, right? But you have to check it. You have to check your information. I, I worked at a magazine for a very long time. We had the luxury of weeks before the magazine would come out before anything was published. Now, social media being in person, being fast, being quick, and eyeballs uh, going to your site and people are so concerned with numbers. I'm, I'm, I'm not like that. And that's one of the reasons why um, I don't promote myself as a breaking news website. I'd rather be slow and steady and get it right. Right, as opposed to you know just just being fast and and running the risk of touching out misinformation. So to answer that question directly, there are, there are systems that that already put in place. It's called fact checking department, where you will get a piece from a writer that writes something. It goes to an editor. Now that that editor, it goes to somebody like me who worked in a fact checking department. I get the document, going through it word by word, asking people the smallest question, like calling you up, are you 35 years old? You really live at such and such. Very yeah. And then ask the lady, yeah. she's like, you don't woman of age, I'm like, well, I have to ask, you know, their age in order to, to make sure that this document is correct. But those are the systems that, that media outlets should have before any uh, information is, is put out. So you do have social media and uh, the thing about social media is more about the immediacy. It's more about getting it first. So that's why when you check now, you may want to check something out or verify your facts from a trusted news source that goes through a, the process of fact checking. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll take one more question from my girl, and then uh, we'll be wrapping up with this uh, Miles. Frank, on mute. On mute again. Frank, you have to unmute. Frank, if you if you hear me, you have to. Can I hear you? Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're good now. Okay. What I was saying is that the audio is not too clear, so uh, my colleagues here are facing difficulties in comprehending what is coming from uh, from your end in terms of the presentation. Perhaps a question could come from your end. Yeah, yeah, I understand the echo. Uh, um, I, I have muted myself here when I give you the opportunity to speak. So I don't know. Okay, maybe I can take a follow up on this on the same on the same trend of questioning concerning misinformation. I have a footage here. I don't know whether it will be able it will be clearly shown to you. Uh, concerning the Haitians leaving Haiti. Can you pick it up? Yes, uh, this footage reported by the media in recent week uh, concerning 
kind of make it wider? They, yeah. Concerning this huge flow of Haitians from uh, their country into uh, Latin America and then eventually up to the Texas border, uh, New York Times reported that initially uh, this huge number of Haitians went in this mass uh, to the border, the American border, out of this information. They heard these things through different channels, social media channels and others, that the border uh, with the United States was open. So thousands of them took there. Uh, in line with uh, managing fake news, uh, what kind of uh, skills you think are necessary uh, in this 24-hour news cycle uh, to ensure that the, uh, the, the, the working press, the, the mainstream press, as you call it, uh, could assist people in trying to deflect some of this misinformation and disinformation to avoid people uh, putting themselves in harm's way. Thank you. Yeah, so well, so you yeah, yeah, but again, he's asking because some somebody may have published that the borders were open, and so it brought this influx of immigrants. And he showed the picture of people trying to cross the Rio Grande to come in the U.S. So what can be well, that, that went yeah. Off with, yeah, they had the uh, officers with no, no, the other one people trying to cross the Rio Grande, just walking across. So the thing here he's asking is that. How can big media institution try to deflect that kind of information, you know, and, 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 and change it around so that it doesn't have people risking their lives thinking that, yes, the border is open because, of course, the border was not open to everybody. We need to come out. Is, was it published? Like, uh, Frank, if you can hear me, when was the information published? Oh, like, uh, uh, social media. I think with something like that, yeah, you would you would want it to trust government news sources. I can just give you the headline. They said. Uh, of misinformation, hope for freedom, triggered by misinformation, leads Haitians to the American border. That's all. Did you get me? Did you get me? Yeah, I think it was, uh, it was published on September 18, 2021. How hope, fear, and misinformation led to the US border. What I'm saying is, how can the mainstream media help to mitigate this kind of things? Because people, the thousands of people who, who, who left for that joining, got it through some form of misinformation to friends, to social media, other, other uh, channels. Um, All right, Frank, we got a question. Yes. So he said the publication was September 18. Uh, but this picture shows thousands of people trying to get across the Rio Grande into, I believe, Texas. But his, his point is that and you started to allude to it where you said they should be trusting government media on that rather than, you know. So his point is, how can that uh, be changed by big uh, government media to put a spin on the story so that people don't trust it and risk their lives? I want to trust the government, but not everyone trusts the government. This is to be honest, right? So that's, that's, that's one source you can go to. You can uh, travel back to them. They'll give you an information on um, traveling or uh, information about the safety of different places. So that's, that's, that's one of my go to wherever you're trying to travel or go to 
check out the government website just to see, you know, if the borders are open or if it's not safe to travel. I, 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 I would start there. All right, Frank, we'll take another question from the American audience. Uh, anyone in the audience have a question so we can wrap up on this? presenters. Um, if you just joining us, this is the uh, media workshop here in Trenton, New Jersey. 
I have Volcano Shelton moderating with friends in Wola uh, facilitating in Liberia um, at the I campus on Kerry Street. We will go to our next presenter, and uh, she is Ms. Janet Stewart, Managing Editor, Impact Principal Writer or Editor. Um, she will be speaking on making impact, covering disability workforce and disaster for ICI. Um, I'll quickly run over her, her profile. Um, again, uh, Jenna Stewart is principal editor and writer for the Institute on Community Integration at the University of Minnesota. A veteran journalist and storyteller to what creates content that advocates for the rights and full inclusion of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. She serves as managing editor of Impact, ICI's flagship publication covering topics important to people with IDD. She also writes frequently for the organization's newsletter, FYI, and other publications. She is particularly interested in writing about the economics of disability, including the financial and social costs of excluding people with disabilities from robust education and meaningful employment. Prior to joining ICI in 2019, she wrote The Journey, a long running nationally syndicated personal finance column Earlier, she was a financial reporter for the Chicago Tribune, uh, Chicago Sun-Times, and other newspapers. She also wrote for Medical Economics and Benchmarks, a publication of the Mar Marshfield, Wisconsin uh, Clinic Health System Foundation. She holds a bachelor's and master's degree from the Medill School of Journalism at Northeastern, or rather Northwestern University. Uh, Janet, uh, we want to welcome you with your presentation. Uh, the folks in Liberia, the folks here in Trenton, looking forward to a beautiful delivery. And after that, we'll engage you with a few questions. Thank you so much for making yourself available. You can go now. Good morning, and thanks for having me. Can you hear me? How's that? Is the Am I coming over OK? Yes, you are. Okay, terrific. And can can I share my? Do you have some slides, or I can go? All right, you co-host, so you can go right ahead. Okay, great. Wonderful. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. I. Um, it was a real treat for me to listen to the to the previous speaker because I, I share, uh, even though we, we have vastly different publications, I think uh, we're all journalists in this room. And so it's it's really great to be here with everyone. Um, you know, I think we kind of have, uh, even though we're across countries and across uh, different types of publications, we're all trying to get a better story told. And so I, I think it's really, terrific to come together in this way and just sort of share uh, tips and experiences and things that worked well or things that didn't work well. Um, and, I, and we can always learn from each other. So I just wanted to talk a little bit today about some of the work uh, that I do as a journalist within an organization. Uh, our organization is called the Institute on Community Integration. We're a research and training and education institute that is part of the University of Minnesota. And our mission is all around making the world a more inclusive place for people with disabilities, mostly intellectual and developmental disabilities, things like autism, um, uh, Down syndrome, you know, all, the, all of the different disabilities that people live with today. And many of them are living much longer lives than, than in previous generations. And so our group of researchers and trainers and experts uh, does applied research and works toward making 
uh, making things a little bit better and more inclusive uh, in, in the world for people with disabilities. A little bit of background, I'm a longtime journalist myself. As you heard in the bio, uh, I've spent almost all of my career as a reporter getting stories mostly about uh, economics and personal finance and trying to um, make do with uh, limited resources. Um, and, you know, have always worked for mainstream media. Uh, and so it was a big shift when I came to kind of write in-house for a university research facility. Um, I was a little nervous about how that was going to go, uh, but I see more and more similarities between what I used to do as a newspaper journalist and what I'm doing today, which is still trying to uncover and tell great stories and present them in different ways. Um, so I'm part of a team here at ICI. We do broadcast, we do online, we do print magazines, we do print reports. Our, our experts in the field uh, write their own very detailed research reports. Uh, we help them a little bit um, to, uh, to tell some of those stories to more diverse audiences, to lay audiences. And so one thing I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about um, just you know, how we do that and you know, hopefully get to some of your questions about different ways that we can cover people who live with disabilities in a way that we can share their stories more uniquely with each other. Um, okay, so next slide here. Uh, we do quite a few uh, publications at the Institute. Um, so this is just a, sort of an amalgamation of, of all the different ones that we do. Uh, as I said, you know, the uh, expanding the circle, you know, some of these community reports, we uh, report uh, to our government funders, we report to the public, we have a lot of different audiences. And so depending on what that audience is, we try to gear the message accordingly uh, to, to what that audience, uh, you know, will get the most out of. So we have websites, for example, one of them being self-advocacy online, that's a website for people with developmental disabilities themselves, where they can um, they can read about each other. They can write in and ask questions. They can see themselves celebrated on those pages. Um, then we have much more scholarly articles written by PhDs and experts in the field of disability talking about advances in uh, in the field. We have. A, a publication and a whole training around keeping students in school, uh, trying to prevent kids from dropping out of school, um, kind of getting those kids who are most at risk, many of them who have some type of intellectual disability, getting them connected to people, to real people, um, not to not just an administrator, but to someone who can act as an advocate for them. We do very timely publications um, uh, twice a month. We have both internal and external newsletters. And so uh, part of my job is writing uh, fairly quick news stories about what our experts are doing in the field. Uh, and we put those in a newsletter and up on the website and rotate those uh, pretty much daily. Uh, what I wanted to talk about most today is a, a flagship publication for ICI that we call Impact. Impact started about 30 years ago as a newsletter, black and white little newsletter, and it's evolved over time to become a full color, more in-depth, about 50 page magazine that we do three times a year. Um, this is one of our most recent covers. Our cover story was or our, our entire issue actually was all about crisis management. And, you know, we're talking about Haiti and we're talking about all the different things that are going on. You know, we've had uh, multiple hurricanes this year, um, all of the different crises and how they impact people with disabilities was the subject of one of our most recent issues. And so one of the things that we've most tried to do is, you know, kind of bring a more of a journalistic perspective to, to what used to be a newsletter. Um, I'm just gonna admit somebody here, there. Um, 
so, you know, rather than uh, just tell a very scholarly research article, we try to balance that with much more personal stories of how people with disabilities are living with some of these crises. So our, this cover story, for example, you see the woman uh, holding on to her mom and they're both um, masked up for the pandemic and holding on to family photos of their brother and son um, who, who died during the pandemic, during the early phases of the pandemic. And uh, this is a woman who worked in the disability field for her entire career, but she still had a very, very difficult process in visiting her brother uh, as he was um, in the nursing home and then eventually hospitalized for COVID. And she told her story directly about kind of taking readers through step by step, day by day, what was happening to uh, her brother and to the family as they watched him go through COVID. And uh, so it, that became one of our um, most read stories of, of that issue because it really does, it, it really does tell that human story. And we balance that with much more scholarly articles elsewhere in the publication to kind of give both sides of it, you know, a very intellectual description of what needs to be done in the field. And of course, COVID and um, the hurricanes and, and, you know, all the other crises that we've had going on in the world over the last couple of years, you know, they've exacerbated problems for people with disabilities, but that story really is just now starting to be told, you know, in the, in the early days of all these crises, it, you know, all the mainstream journalism outlets really needed and understandably needed to focus on the, you know, what was happening with everyone, all of the crisis that we were all living through. But to be honest, people with disabilities really kind of got put aside. Um, you know, they were kind of an afterthought. There were even hospitals around the world where people with disabilities were kind of put at the back of the line uh, to receive ventilators or even just life-saving equipment or prevention equipment um, because they had disabilities. It got back to this very old idea of people with disabilities being less important than others. And so this became a really important time for impact to tell these stories, not only of what's going on in the current crisis with the pandemic and some of these major storms that are that have been hitting around the world, um, but to to take some people who are leaders in the field and talk about, you know, let, let's look at the death rates of people with disabilities. They're three, sometimes six times, not 6%, but six times higher than people without disabilities. And so breaking through with, with some of those stories, both from a from a researcher's point of view, and then also from the human point of view, was really important to kind of get this message across that we cannot forget uh, the, the folks who need extra help uh, during this time. So, uh, so that was that was an issue that that really, um, and also creating the issue, the issue while we were on you know kind of on lockdown was uh, was pretty ambitious. Um, there was one story we found a, a person with a disability um, who had founded a, a nonprofit organization years ago um, uh, for disaster relief for people with disabilities. And, you know, we kind of told his story, but because he had a disability himself, writing was difficult for him. Um, he was so busy in the crisis that he didn't really have time to sit down and really think about drafting a long feature story about his life and how he founded this organization. So, and, and we even had a problem connecting on Zoom. So one day I just got on WhatsApp with him and shared a quick conversation. And then we got on the telephone and he just started telling me his story and I started taking the notes down and he, he so beautifully told his story just sitting with me as a conversation 
it would have been very difficult for him to think of all this and and write it all down in a narrative but he just kind of told me as as if he were walking me through his organization about how he lived through his first earthquake in Chile and how that inspired him to, as they were doing the cleanup, he wasn't physically able to help with that cleanup because of his disability, but it gave him the idea to start a new organization of people with disabilities that would go out in the community and talk to all, all kinds of different cities and states and colleges about what do we do in emergencies? How do we help people with disabilities when some kind of disaster strikes? And so we had a conversation of about an hour, a little, little bit over an hour. And I just kind of, usually I like to record these conversations, but that wasn't possible because of the logistics. So I just took a bunch of notes and, and really just turned that conversation into a first person narrative. Uh, you know, he told his own story. I typed that all out and uh, we put that together as a story and it became another one of our very well-read stories for that issue. And so I guess what I learned in all of this um, as sort of a journalist approaching the magazine, you know, we, we are a magazine that doesn't have the luxury of um, paying writers to go out and do a traditional journalistic take on a story. So my job is to recruit authors both to write about their scientific work, but also to tell their personal stories of founding these organizations and how they did it um, and get them to write those stories themselves, which you know is a is a different sort of uh, task. Um, and you know one of the key things involved in all of that, um, and, and I, I'm guessing that you all can relate to this as you get people to talk either on camera or for your stories is, you know, and, and we talked about this a little with the last speaker, how do we verify all this? If we, you know, if we don't have a journalist that's going out and checking all of these facts, how do we get that done? That, that was a big concern of mine as, as we first started, you know, doing this format and, and getting some of these stories. And the way, we, the way we are doing that is we have a panel of guest editors for each issue. Each issue we do, uh, we focus on one subject. And so we get three or four experts in that field who act as an editor, as a guest editor just for that issue. And so if I get an article in from someone and something doesn't seem right or um, I'm not really sure about a certain fact. Uh, I have that group of issue editors who read all these articles and can pose questions or raise issues. You know, this hasn't been my experience. Um, I think we need to check into this a little bit more. And so, you know, fortunately, because we're not a daily paper, we have the time to go back and and check certain facts that don't quite jive with what the other experts in the field are seeing. And so that creates a much deeper and much richer story. Um, our, most, our most recent issue um, after the, the crisis issue, we took a look at um, the progress of people with disabilities in the arts. You know, the movie and film industry is huge in the United States and worldwide. And more uh, film directors and uh, executive producers are looking to cast people with disabilities in, in roles, not only for, um, for when the roles call for someone with a disability, but when you know, they're just a person living life. Um, and so I'm just gonna admit somebody else. Okay. And so when, um, you know, and so when we, uh, basically um, got our lineup of people that we wanted to uh, include in the magazine, um, we asked them to write about, you know, what's that like as all these studios are making all of these promises about hiring more people with disabilities, is that actually happening? And, and what do the actors and the artists and the painters think about 
this new sort of limelight that they're getting that, you know, is it, is it really turning into more work for people with art, people and other artists in that field? Um, and so that, you know, that was an issue that we explored uh, most recently. We're working on uh, an issue now about uh, aging and retirement. And what does that mean? You know, in the United States, retirement is very linear, has been very linear. Um, you work a long time, you save up, and then hopefully in retirement, you have a little bit of money to spend. Well, people with disabilities have really for the most part, been denied that work over their careers. So what does retirement even look like for them? And now that science has made it so that more people with disabilities are living longer, are living into older ages, how are we gonna deal with that as a society? Um, you know, we've, we've already got many people struggling at, at or below the poverty line. What's that gonna mean as all these people age? Um, and so we're bringing in uh, experts, in, you know, in the field of disabilities to talk about that. Um, and then what we're trying to do uh, with this, you know, with, with each issue, we kind of try to do something a little bit new. You know, the, the, the first issue I did was all about self-advocacy. And so our goal was to get all of the articles written by or with someone with disabilities. And then in the, you know, in the crisis issue, we really tried to tell those very personal stories of what it was like to live through COVID for people with disabilities. Um, with this particular issue on aging, we're starting to talk outside of the disability area. You know, we, we talk as a disability community with each other very well, and we talk at each other very well. But what about journalists who've never really covered disability? How do we reach, um, how do we reach general people who just really don't even understand disability a little bit more with some of these stories? And so one of the things uh, that we did with this issue was we invited onto our team of issue editors, a journalist uh, from an organization called Minnesota Public Radio. It's part of the NPR network in the States. And he is serving as an issue editor for us on this issue of retirement. He's written a lot about retirement. He also writes for an organization called Next Avenue. Um, so he's, he's spent uh, more than a decade uh, telling these stories of, of just people and, and what they do you know, as they get older and, and what does aging look like and, and, and how can we preserve the, the number of good years that people have before uh, the effects of age really start to take hold. And so he is serving on our panel of editors for the impact issue. And then in turn, he's going to do a couple of podcasts and a couple of stories out of this experience of, of sitting in as an editor that he will do for his broadcast outlets. Um, and so it's more of a more of an exchange. It's a, it makes us a little vulnerable because we're opening up to the mainstream media and, and letting them come in and see our process and ask us tough questions. Um, and I can't help but think, fingers crossed, that that's going to be a good thing, um, that, that by exposing uh, some of these writers and some of these you know, real personal stories to the mainstream journalists and the mainstream um, media outlets, um, and then to the public itself, um, by telling these stories, uh, we'll get people with disabilities more, uh, more a part, more a real part of their communities. And that's really what, what ICI is, is all about. Um, and so at this point, I just wanted to pause as we're talking about just sort of the making of a magazine and, and finding, these, uh, finding these stories. Does anyone have any questions about uh, the way we, we put this magazine together? Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Stewart. Um, uh, Frank, can you hear me from there? Okay, I see the applaud. So, 
Uh, your mic, you got to unmute again, Frank. The, the audio and the video has been very clear. So yeah. I believe a lot of my colleagues picked up the uh, presentation very well. We see the hand, one hand up, and that hand is a hand who is always into writing about people, people with disabilities. Our colleague Samuel Dwell, come up from. No, Okay, we will take the mic. Chat, Nina, Nina. Nina. I think I think the guy should come to the microphone because now we we're losing signal. Uh, come, come back. Magazine, which I think she energized some of the yes, uh, even more experience well, well, I like, yeah, like. about developing the yeah. interest because in our right country, do that, yeah. world, and I know that happens in America, uh, issues of people with disabilities, yeah, human yeah, interests, yeah. uh, sometimes more often than not downplayed for the high political conflict stories. I'm conflict and what I mean. So we'll take this question from our colleague, Dwight. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Samuel G. Uh, I'm a Liberian journalist uh, based in Liberia here, member of the President of Liberia, and President of the Liberia Association of Writers. Uh, I'm a development journalist. Uh, I'm not involved with the political reporting that is not my area. But my, my special specialty is on persons with disability. In 2013, I've been writing about them. It is my, my, my best presentation, even though I've not heard about this, my best because it's from my area. Now, uh, I just remember for you have here personal story devastation and devastating, hunting, heartbreaking, and inhumane uh, loss in the time of COVID. Now, in Liberia, uh, the disabled people, they are the most hit in, in the COVID 19 period. And for now, I don't have any knowledge of whether there's a functioning uh, welfare program for them. You find people who are visually impaired that will normally call blind, they go about no food. Uh, you find person in wheelchair. Just yesterday, I saw a single mother in a wheelchair with a daughter, a kid, a one day old kid, rolling a wheelchair, no helper, begging around in central Morovia. They are just there in the vehicle, no way. They are hungry, they are crying, and we don't have a welfare program. So I was just talking to my brother, uh, Charles, who is agile representative here, but I can be connected with you, and I will do it later on. Uh, but is there any welfare program uh, by your government in your country you live that cater to persons with disability so that we can, we can tie in that, we can call our government attention using other people's experiences? Thank you so much, and God bless you. Uh, thank I, I I think I picked up on the the main gist of that question, um, and I my heart breaks to hear what what I think you were describing about what you're seeing, and I would just encourage you to keep telling those stories because they are very very compelling and can really move people to action. Uh, when, when you asked about resources, um, ICI, the Institute on Community Integration, has a division, a global inclusion division, and they are focused on working with the United Nations and other global organizations um, with grant funding to go into different communities and and do programming and do assistance for people with disabilities in other countries. And so I would recommend you going to the ICI website um, at the University of Minnesota and look uh, for the, search the term global inclusion. Um, we have a, a pair of researchers, uh, Renata Tika and Brian Avery who specialize in this. And in fact, um, it's interesting you bring this up because one of our impact issues for within the next year is going to be on global 
on global issues for people with disabilities. So I'd love for you to, you can, through the organizers here, you can get my email um, and maybe we could keep in touch and write some stories together for that issue. That would be exciting. And that's very good, uh, Dr. Stewart, or rather Professor Stewart. Um, Frank, is there anyone else? Your mic is uh, muted, so you got to unmute. Go ahead, Frank. Good afternoon. Yes. We know that media practitioners, journalists are those who smell stories of people with disabilities. Actually, we know that media practitioners and journalists are those who flag stories of people living with disabilities. And you don't find them saying their own stories. And I want to know from Janet, what are programs that your government have, have been doing to reach out to those journalists that we here in Nigeria as journalists we can recommend to our government in order to help people living with disabilities because nowadays disability in Liberia is a serious problem. You see that there are not more programs offered for them. You see people living with disabilities, they have become there because they are all in the streets. So I would like you to recommend some programs that journalists in Liberia can recommend to our government so that they can be able to reach out to those people. Okay, we'll just take the last question, then uh, at, uh, uh, Professor Stewart can answer it. Uh, again, I, I think I picked up the gist of the question of talking about more resources. Um, another resource that comes to mind with the NICI, we do have, uh, we do have folks that, that go to um, all parts of the globe to do trainings and um, uh, help help with uh, entrepreneurial ventures. Um, there are there are these programs that do exist. There are not, you know, there 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 are not enough of them. Um, but ICI does have those programs. So I would I again I would suggest going to the ICI website um, and getting in touch. You know, Joe can put you in touch with some of our people who work in these areas and and we can connect you with some of those resources. We'd love to do that, as a matter of fact. All right. Um, Frank, we'll come here to the American audience. Uh, anyone in the audience have any questions? Well, not, not a question. I just want to add to, to what Janet was saying. Uh, so at ICI, I've become the kind of uh, uh, African ambassador, basically. Um, kind of lead most of our African in, uh, in, you know, so I, I can make this commitment on behalf of ICI that uh, in terms of our global out outreach activities, um, we will back to Alja and come up with a, a training. If there are like journalists that are interested in disability specific uh, training or, or how to cover or tell the stories of people with disabilities, uh, that's something we, we can work on for next year. Uh, and, and, and also, if there are uh, local businesses, because you know we just did an entrepreneurship training in in, uh, in Kenya um, last month, actually for for two weeks. Um, it was a year long training, so we can partner with Aja uh, through the U.S. Embassy in Liberia and find a grant uh, that we can also uh, do something in Liberia similar to the project in, in Kenya. Um, so, but uh, a director of outreach, that's our commitment. And so I'm hoping that will drive that. Um, you guys reach out and we can find something. 
Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you. Um, Frank, let's take one more question from the audience in Liberia, and then we'll take leave of Madam Stewart. You got to, you got to. Uh, I believe my historian people need to do the ability. Uh, they have a technique and a difficult task. What are the techniques that you use to write uh, stories that will suit people who live, people who live with disability? Thank you. Um, if you didn't hear the question, uh, Madam Stewart, he's asking about techniques that uh, reporters can use to write stories about people with disabilities? Uh, I do I do have a couple that have worked really well for me since, you know, um, when I first, um, you know, all the, all the time since I've been a journalist, you know, listening obviously is a, is a critical skill, right? Um, but when you're working with someone with a disability to tell that story, you'd be surprised if you, if you truly take a breath and, and pause for a second and really listen to what they're saying and then ask them about it and get them to say it in a, maybe a different way. Um, you, you can really hear them better and you can tell a much better story. So for example, uh, I've interviewed a few people over Zoom and I record it and you know, we'll talk about, you know, what, what's important to you. You know, so many times people with disabilities get interviewed by journalists and the, the, the story that comes out is really written, you know, more about the journalist's perspective. Um, and, and I've done this myself, so I, I'm, I'm guilty of this as, as anyone. But if you really listen to the person with disabilities and, and tell it in their words, um, it can be much, much more powerful. Um, you know, it's, it's really getting inside their story and getting inside their shoes and letting them just talk for a bit. Um, sometimes you might not think in the moment that it's fitting the rest of your story or that it's making sense, but if you get it all down and really go back over it and you see what's important to them um, and you put it in those terms. You know, um, here we have in the disability community, we have a, a concept called person first language. Um, so, you know, rather than calling, rather than saying, um, you know, Mary is a disabled person, we say Mary is a person with disabilities. And you know, before I came to ICI, I didn't, I didn't think about those kinds of semantics very much. Um, I just wanted to get the story. Uh, but, but now that I've studied this more, this, this idea of putting the person ahead of the disability, you start to ask better questions. You start to ask what else is in your life besides this disability that makes you unique? And you bring that out in the story and people really gravitate to it. They really understand more that this is a human being first. And yes, they have a disability of some description, but that isn't the entirety of who they are. And you know, today, all of media around the world is really focused on things like inclusion and making sure that, that people's voices really are heard. And that's a perfect fit for this kind of work because this is, a, this is a vast group of people whose stories have not been told. And if you, the more you can step back and let them tell it themselves, the more compelling the story is. All right, we want to thank uh, Madam Jeanette Stewart for your presentation. Could we get a round of applause? Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, and again, I want to remind you if you're just joining us uh, on social media, uh, we're coming live from KMTV.
both in America and that of Liberia. Uh, our audience at the I campus on Kerry Street being facilitated by Frank Sinwala and Volcano Shelton here in the US moderating uh, these uh, hybrid workshop uh, presentations. Again, we say thank you to Alja for uh, putting this together. It is, it is very, very important that we continue to provide training for our colleagues, not just in, in, in Liberia, but even some of us here in the US who are still semi-practicing can learn uh, from these presentation. And we want to thank you so much for coming in uh, today. So we'll now move on. Uh, you, you can log yourself out. <laughs> good, good. So we'll now move on uh, to our next uh, presenter. And the presenter is now with us. Um, his name is Dr. Musonda Kapa, Kapa Tamoyo, if I got it right. Um, he is the chair of the institutions at Illinois University, Edwardsville, Illinois. His presentation is on new media technology and digital reporting. Um, he teaches writing and design for the web, modern media, or uh, use in mass media and new technology and media and information technology and society. His research interests include use and impact of web 2.0 for ubiquitous uh, learning and political economy of media. Um, my fellow colleagues in Liberia and here in the US, let's give a rousing welcome to Dr. Kappa Tamoyo as he makes his presentation. Okay. Um, I wanted to share my screen. I'm trying to make you co-host that you can. All right, so you can do that now. I can? Okay. Yeah, you're good to go. Oh. Okay, uh, it's still not allowing me to share the screen. It's not allowing me to share the screen, sorry. What should I do? You wanna try again? Try, try again, because you've been made co-host. Okay. Okay. Let's see if it's working. Okay. Well, thank you so much uh, for um, uh, inviting me to make a presentation at this uh, uh, wonderful um, uh, conference. And uh, I'm just listening to Professor Stewart. Uh, I think uh, I'm going to incorporate some of her work uh, in my discussion here. Um, my discussion is about new media technologies and digital reporting. Uh, my name's um, Sonda Kapatamoyo. I'm actually originally from Zambia, uh, but I'm a professor here at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, uh, where I chair the mass communications department. So I'm going to approach uh, this uh, discussion um, from um, uh, sort of like a learning 
uh, I know that uh, the audience here is uh, kind of uh, varied. Some are practic practitioners, others are, are students, and uh, you know different stages of uh, interaction with uh, um, this industry. So I'm going to try and incorporate a whole lot of stuff. Um, how much time do I have, sir? Okay. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, as far as uh, uh, news reporting nowadays, uh, we like to think of it as a multi-platform. So I like to use this graphic here that has a de desktop, a tablet, and a smartphone. Um, I should have included one with uh, actually a TV and radio and newspaper and all these other kind of things. Because uh, what we have now is uh, convergence. Uh, the convergence happens on multi-platform. So this would be sort of the background I'll use uh, to make some of the discussions and the assumptions that I talk about. Um, I'll be talking about uh, the newsroom, which is uh, still very staple to uh, how people get news. I'll talk about audiences. I'll talk about analytics, and then some trends in the industry and uh, some micro blogging tools and social media tools, and then cloud computing, which is uh, very essential nowadays, and some future possibilities that uh, we can start thinking about as we uh, implement our um, systems in different countries. So a newsroom, uh, as we've become accustomed to, is uh, where news is gathered and the reports are prepared for broadcasting or publication. Um, so it's basically um, a place where people that are tasked with uh, organizing, uh, first of all, uh, getting information, organizing it, and then disseminating it, that's where they meet. So we just call that the newsroom. Um, the way we teach our students here in my university is um, uh, trying to make them work in groups and uh, we try to simulate a newsroom uh, in, in that regard, uh, because we expect that when they go out to find a job, they'll be working with other people. And I'll talk about the different skills that uh, we kind of inculcate in the students before they leave. And I think every journalist uh, should have one or two of those in order to be very effective uh, as a news uh, gatherer and news uh, disseminator. So some skills that you need to run an operation, and these are things that we uh, teach our students ourselves here, um, how to be good reporters. Um, certainly you have to, um, to be a good reporter, you have to uh, learn the skills of uh, writing, interviewing, uh, putting pieces together. And I'm sure in this conference you spoke, you, you, you've discussed some of those things, including uh, how to use the pyramid style and citations and things like that. Because without that, then you know you don't have uh, a good story. Or if you have a good story, then it's not well done. Um, photography is also important. Um, nowadays, of course, it's made easier because of uh, smartphones. You know, you can use that to get your pictures and uh, put them in a story. Uh, also, cameras, uh, believe it or not, are still very important uh, part of a uh, news operation. Um, so there's different digital cameras that are actually pretty cheap nowadays and uh, they do help with uh, storage of video and uh, still pictures and uh, those are staple in the newsroom of course and then sound and lighting um, this is important because uh, if you're going to have uh, content that goes on the, on the web for example um, it, it has to look nice uh, the same thing with uh, content that goes uh, on tv uh, you know this, this type of uh, <clears throat> online uh, dissemination uh, so as a journalist, you have to know the angles, you know, the color, uh, um, uh, how to use colors and things like that, or filters and things like that. Um, and then also editing. Uh, this is an important thing. I, uh, I'm a stickler for, uh, you know, good editing. Uh, every time I pick up a newspaper, I'm looking for mistakes pretty much. Um, so, um, and then I, you know, I go and, and uh, mark them out, and uh, I use that as uh, teachable uh, moments for my students also. Editing again, and then receptionists, and then archiving. Uh, another skill that we need is uh, uh, graphic design. Uh, this cannot be overemphasized because uh, uh, graphic designers are the ones that are going to put uh, you know, um, content in a way that uh, is presentable. 
if you have a picture, for example, you can crop it, you can, you can uh, increase some focus on certain things and graphic designers do that. I should have actually added uh, people that do in design as well. Uh, so they can help with the layout of uh, uh, contents in a print publication. So uh, what's going on in the newsroom is um, uh, convergence, uh, different kinds of convergences that I'll be talking about here, uh, but convergence basically on um, of multimedia to start with, and then also on multi-platforms. Um, so what's happening, uh, as you, we all know, is uh, with multimedia, you have text, audio, video, um, all sorts of stuff that can be combined together and uh, disseminated as one piece of the story. And um, uh, you also have multi-platform, uh, like I indicated earlier, where you have a desktop, you have a tablet, you have a smartphone, you have a TV, all carrying the same uh, story. Uh, later on, I'll talk about the type of skills that you need to, um, to do that effectively. Uh, so as a journalist, um, what we want is, uh, for you to be able to manipulate your audio properly, your visual and your narrative form uh, to give to somebody up above that are going to also edit it or help you produce it before it goes out to the public. And I'll be talking about the audiences and what the audiences want in this regard. Um, so these news materials have to be uh, prepared for different formats. Uh, we've become used to, of course, uh, to uh, prints, which is the newspapers or magazines, but also TV, and then you bring in online. And with online, you have uh, ability to do the texts, the video, and audio as well. Um, so these are some of the skills that people would need in the newsroom. Convergence uh, also affects uh, the technology and then the industries as well, uh, culture and social changes. Um, this uh, gentleman, Harry Jenkins, uh, in 2006, uh, he wrote about convergence, uh, which I thought was topical at that point, uh, not just as uh, devices coming together or multi-platform, but he increased the, um, the definition to include uh, things of uh, like culture and business and uh, social changes and things like that. So I'll touch on a bit of that because uh, once you understand that convergence is not happening in a vacuum, then, um, it will help us become better uh, content creators and content distributors as well. So there are different kinds of uh, uh, convergence that uh, I can uh, talk about. One is the technology. Um, the other is uh, media, con media and content, and then services applications, and then uh, just robots and machines, and then VR and AR. Uh, with technology, um, I think this is pretty common. We all know that uh, uh, with the uh, advent of uh, smart devices, uh, like the smartphone, uh, everything can kind of uh, be streamed through that channel. Uh, but with media and content, it's uh, about uh, uh, interacting different types of uh, content, uh, text, audio, video, and whatnot. Uh, and then services, where you combine different services to form part of the story. So in this case, it could be uh, you have a, um, website and then on your website you have a facebook uh, link or twitter link that uh, when somebody clicked on it takes them to a story that you prepared for that other platform as well so that's very common nowadays and it helps people reach uh, your story from different angles uh, but also there's interaction with machines nowadays uh, there's uh, content that's created solely by machines um, so what's going on in this uh, sector is um, using algorithms uh, we use our algorithms to basically prepare stories for us. So in our program, uh, I uh, myself, I teach uh, application program interface where we create uh, these algorithms that are searching for information off Twitter and off Facebook. And uh, after you gather a whole lot of uh, content, you can now data mine it and then uh, prepare a story or just come up with themes or do a visualization of the story. So robots and uh, different kinds of machine learning is uh, helping a lot with uh, journalistic practices. Uh, it um, uh, saves up time. Uh, the preparation and back end is, is a lot because uh, different people in, are involved here. They're not pretty much journalists. They're people that are doing coding or computer programming, but uh, it's not difficult to do. And uh, I would encourage people to uh, actually um, venture into this or just learn something about it. And then virtual reality and augmented reality are some of the things that we're seeing nowadays where um, uh, you know, avatars are doing the talking on our behalf. 
uh, avatars are doing sort of searches on our behalf and so forth. So people are being repressed uh, in a way or being helped by uh, VR uh, to um, communicate their content. Um, there's a continuum that Jenkins came up with that I like to talk about as well in terms of uh, um, you know, digital platforms and uh, digital media and digital reporting. Uh, one is cross promotion. So uh, when you work as a journalist or content creator, you want to uh, cross promote your work with other people. Um, this increases your reach. And uh, as you see later on, uh, reach is important because uh, of analytics. So I'll talk about analytics towards the end. Another one is cloning where the same content is used on multiple or different uh, media. So basically what we do uh, in our program is uh, uh, we have a newspaper as well where students are writing stories and uh, that story that they wrote would end up on the website. Uh, the same story will end up on a mobile app, but then also uh, towards the end of the week, they're going to be reading those stories in the podcast. So just one story has uh, four ways of dissemination in the print, uh, online, in the uh, mobile application and also in the podcast. Um, that helps, of course, with the uh, reach of the story, but it's also just cloning and you're not doing more work. Uh, you're just doing it different, different uh, places. Uh, another one could be competition, uh, where different uh, organizations compete with one another, uh, but it's healthy competition. So uh, what I've seen um, in our continent, for example, is uh, you know, African journalists can be everywhere. But if you wanted to get information from a uh, uh, you know, different country, you could have uh, one or two journalists there that are providing uh, the content and different uh, news uh, media or news organizations in their home country uh, fighting for that information or for those sources. Uh, but it's healthy competition. Another one is content sharing, where uh, our content is basically shared between uh, uh, different ownership organizations and full convergence where all this stuff comes together, which includes uh, the collection, the production and distribution, uh, basically to maximize uh, potential for everybody. Uh, I think we're all familiar with the AP um, Associated Press uh, system and uh, maybe even BBC does this because uh, I've heard uh, you know, journalists saying, uh, uh, citing the BBC or monitoring the BBC, you know, for things like that, that happen in places where they cannot be. So those are the uh, convergence uh, uh, things that we talk about in the continuum model. Okay, so to end off uh, with Jenkins uh, in his uh, book, uh, which uh, maybe people should pick up and uh, it's very insightful, I like it. Uh, he said that convergence is the content flow uh, on some media platforms, collaboration between industry and media and media migration activity. So basically just broaden it up and uh, you can enter convergence from different angles and uh, his uh, definition will still be relevant. For journalists, convergence could mean uh, something else or not very much something else. Anyway, so in this case, uh, for journalists, we have newsroom convergence. This is where uh, uh, different people come together, they're working together, and they're working on tasks that they're responsible for. So I mentioned earlier about the different things that are people doing in a newsroom, which uh, in our case actually drive the curriculum, where you have people that are in front of the camera, others are in the back of the camera. Uh, what I mean by that is um, in front of the camera, you have the anchors that are reading the teleprompter, um, you know, that have uh, written the scripts, you have actors or things like that. Behind the camera, you have the producers, you have the cameraman, you have people driving the teleprompter, you have all sorts of uh, uh, you know, skills that are needed. But all together, these people come um, as one team and then they create a story. Uh, it could be very intense depending on um, uh, the size of the operation. Uh, if it's, uh, for example, if you're running a sports show uh, in a football game, uh, you need so many people doing the cameras, doing the interviews and doing the statistics and doing all sorts of stuff. So newsroom convergence is something that uh, we see uh, quite a bit and then there's news gathering coverages where uh, people that have uh, different multitasking skills bring those skills together. Um, so I already spoke about uh, the types of jobs that are in a newsroom. Now imagine that uh, you are kind of uh, shorthanded. Uh, one person might be doing the web, 
might be doing the camera work, might be doing uh, statistics, all at the same time. Um, so you have to learn some of those skills. So I'll talk about some skills that uh, help uh, journalists in modern era to uh, be multitaskers. And then uh, there's content convergence, of course, uh, which is uh, the combination of different media to create a story. Um, these also drive our curriculum in my program. Uh, so for example, we're teaching uh, Photoshop. Uh, everybody here has to learn some Photoshop. Um, we teach uh, web design, everybody has to learn that. We teach uh, audio production. Uh, people that are doing audio production uh, major have to do that. And then you have uh, video, which is video production, we have podcasts and things like that. So there's many ways that uh, a journalist can actually uh, package their work and uh, distribute it. And uh, the more of these that somebody knows, uh, the better, I think. So what about the audience? So we are basically working for people, other people, and uh, that's the audience. Um, so let's talk about the audience and how they impact our work. Um, this cannot be overemphasized enough. Uh, know, knowing your audience is important. I equate it uh, as a staple. Uh, we all work in different places, you know. Uh, the context is different depending on where you work. Uh, the context is different every day, depending on what the story is. So we always encourage uh, journalists uh, to learn some of these things. Uh, the key demographic segments have to be understood. For example, ethnicity or economic, um, you know, just economic status of different people, uh, their ideological leanings, the social makeup, the politics, the power brokers, uh, and the whole button issues. So uh, depending on the story, um, it might impact uh, one ethnicity or one ethnic group, uh, maybe negatively than another. So as a journalist, you have to be sensitive to that fact. Um, economics, um, also very important. Uh, in the United States, this is a big deal because uh, elections uh, sometimes are decided just on economics. When people think you know, they'll get a better deal from this party, they vote for that party. And uh, if they're getting a raw deal from this other party, they kick them out, you know, that kind of thing. Um, ideology is also very important. Uh, we all know that the world is uh, full of people with different convictions and uh, they do want their stories to be told. Uh, sometimes the stories have to be, some of that conviction has to be uh, challenged, but as a journalist, you really have to understand the ide ideological makeup of uh, what your audience is. Same thing with social makeup. Uh, in the years now, we are having um, uh, minority uh, groups are increasing in number uh, to, uh, to kind of flip what becomes the majority in the next uh, several years. So uh, white people will not be the, um, the majority uh, as compared to all minorities combined. So um, that does reflect a big change in uh, how content is going to be created and how content is going to be distributed and how it's going to be uh, understood. So as a journalist, you have to be uh, alive to these facts and uh, start operating you know, in that paradigm. Politics, politics, politics. Oh my goodness, this one is, uh, is a big one. Um, Right now, with, uh, like in the US, we have this uh, vaccine politics. Uh, some people want vaccines, others don't want vaccines. And then now uh, the beefing and also, you know, just uh, uh, creating chaos uh, in some cases um, because of politics. So uh, this is a big deal uh, all over the world. Um, as a journalist, we have to understand that and then to contextualize things uh, through that lens. The power brokers. Uh, these are people that uh, movers and shakers, and uh, they affect journal journalism uh, positively, sometimes negatively. Uh, positively in the sense that you could be helped by them uh, as, a, as a source of information. If you have a good, uh, if you have a good uh, connection with one of these people, they'll, they'll let you into their inner circles, maybe at the city government or at the uh, magistrate court or whatever. But they can also make our work difficult uh, because uh, they have the power to block things, you know. Uh, so I believe that uh, journalism is. Uh, um, I believe journalism is one of the biggest factors for a democratic uh, society. Without uh, journalists that are probing these power brokers, uh, we shall learn very little. 
because you know they don't want to share a lot, a lot of stuff uh, with us. So um, power brokers are people that we need to know. And then hot button issues. Uh, this change, um, I don't know what's pertaining right now in Liberia, but uh, uh, for example, here in the US, there's uh, hot button issues all the time. Uh, now it's vaccines, and then there's abortion, there's racism, there's, uh, uh, I mean, it, it can be anything really. Um, uh, but these are something, some things that as journalists, we have to know uh, about our audiences. And uh, how we know about audiences through uh, audience research, um, there's uh, tools that you can use to learn about your audience. You can use a survey. Um, sometimes you, you can just anecdotal evidence uh, that you see. Uh, sometimes you read about it in the library, but a journalist really has a lot of work uh, to learn about the audience. Um, I heard uh, Professor Stewart earlier talking about uh, uh, how we talk about people with disabilities and uh, how we include them uh, as uh, uh, people with agency in their uh, stories that we describe. Uh, I look at that as a community, and it could be any community pretty much. Um, we have to use the communities to find ideas about you know, how you write these stories, because uh, you just might get an angle that you didn't know. Um, sometimes, uh, as journalists, especially uh, people like us living in the diaspora, you want to go to a different place and then you come with your own assumptions. Uh, I think that is wrong. Um, you have to take a step back and listen to what's on the ground in that community and then report based on that context. Um, other things that we need as journalists, of course, is having a good relationship with editors. Um, one of the things that's off-putting uh, for readers is um, when the story is not well researched or well written, or it's got a lot of errors, um, that cannot be fixed by having a good relationship with an editor. Uh, journalists should also be good at uh, joining some of these groups, like internet groups. Um, what's going on uh, nowadays is uh, there's a lot of uh, misinformation and disinformation. Sometimes there's uninformation. So, uh, misinformation is where you get people just giving you wrong stuff. And then disinformation is uh, they're uh, taking out some stuff from uh, actual truth. And then uninformation, they uh, give a little bit, but also give a bit of both uh, true and untrue information and so forth. Um, the way you get to that uh, realization is by joining the source of these uh, uh, people where they're peddling this information. And internet news groups are one of them. Um, mostly on Facebook. Um, once you join the group, you become part of the inner circle, then you understand what context is and so forth. Um, another is blogs. Um, I like uh, to search blogs because people write there and filter, you know. Um, travel blogs, for example, or health blogs, are actually very useful uh, as uh, research for your stories uh, because uh, people are writing about stuff that they're experiencing. Um, so, for example, if I was going to go to Liberia, uh, I've never been, I'd like to go there one day because um, I have friends from there. Um, I'd like to read about Liberia before I go. Uh, the newspaper might not be the best place at that time because the news changes all the time, uh, but a blog might be really good. Somebody that traveled there and they saw some things that they, they liked, you know, things that they didn't like, and they gave recommendations where to go and where not to go and things like that. So. All that is part of news gathering. And uh, last is uh, search engines. Search engines are really useful, uh, but a lot of people, believe it or not, do not know how to use Google properly uh, in the sense of uh, getting the best results. So um, this is something that uh, I'm very uh, kind of uh, not passionate, but I really want to emphasize this to my students about how to use search engines uh, properly. There's different search engines uh, but there's ways that you can use them to uh, find the correct information at the uh, most efficient way. Instead of getting like a thousand, you know, uh, options of a story, you can get five good ones, depending on how you did your search parameters in the search engines. Okay. Another thing I said I'll talk about is cloud computing. Um, cloud computing has become a friend to uh, journalists. Uh, basically, cloud computing is about moving different services and uh, computation and data off-site. 
to an internal external location that's transparent or centralized. So what this means is that um, if you are working as a journalist uh, with your desktop, uh, you want to be saving your work someplace else. Um, so easy uh, places to save will be things like Dropbox, um, where or just even a Google. Uh, um, yeah, you can save it in Google, Google Drive, uh, OneDrive, uh, different places because uh, in case something happens to your desktop you can reach it from another computer some other place just by logging in. Uh, so cloud computing uh, has really helped us, um, especially when you're moving around a lot. Uh, there are certain tools that uh, we teach our students here where they'll put in some work and then they go to different place and open it on a smartphone and edit it. And then they go to different place, open it in an iPad and edit it and just they keep moving around like that. But one thing that's happening is that they're not using up their own device for uh, computational work. Uh, it's being done by a service someplace else. They're not using up their storage. And also, as long as they have the password that uh, useful to them or useful to their group, anybody can work on that same project at different places. So cloud computing is something that uh, journalists now have to learn about and uh, have to know or look for those services uh, in different places. So this is how it works and this is how it helps us. Um, you have a cloud. Uh, not the cloud in the sky, but uh, you know the cloud as we describe it, it's an infrastructure. Uh, but it offers reliability because once you put your stuff in the cloud, you can find it in different places, like I said. And it's also giving access uh, to yourself and different people that have the uh, login. Uh, also flexibility, when meaning you can work at different places and uh, you're not tied to one device. Uh, it's also very secure in the sense that um, uh, these companies that provide cloud services, their reputation rests on things being secure. If stuff is not secure, nobody's going to work with that, or nobody's going to put stuff in that cloud. Uh, so basically, security is what they are, are working on. And then mobility as well, um, just like accessibility and flexibility, you can move around and different people can work in that project. So uh, as journalists, we have to uh, learn about cloud computing. There are different services, uh, that maybe when I when I send this uh, PowerPoint to uh, Samuel and the other guys that are organizing this conference, I can add links to um, I can add links to the different cloud computing services that are useful to uh, journalists. Uh, some other things that we use uh, for news gathering and uh, news reporting, uh, microblogging, and social media, of course. Um, The reason we do that is because it's very easy to uh, publish uh, short updates on a microblog, very easy to use. And they also have longer reach. You know, People uh, all over the world can see them at the same time. And that makes it very, very effective. So there are a few examples, uh, like Twitter is very common, uh, Facebook, Pounce, Jaiku, Tumblr, and so forth. But there's several. And uh, just like with cloud computing services, I'm going to add some links here to some of the ones that uh, journalists are using quite a bit. Okay, what about analytics? So uh, there's a saying, uh, I didn't come up with this one, so I don't even know who to credit, but it says that uh, you cannot improve what you cannot measure. You cannot improve what you cannot measure. So everything's about measurement, you know? Um, I teach uh, data analytics as well. And uh, the, the reason I feel that uh, this is an important part of uh, um, journalism is because, like I said earlier on, when you're doing your audience research, you want to know what your audience wants. Uh, you also want to know um, who your audience is. And uh, once you figure out those factors out, then your stories are going to be more targeted. Um, so essentially, we have two kinds of analytics. Uh, we have a quantitative and the qualitative, uh, what I call the what versus the why. So when you go quantitative analysis, uh, you're going to learn about what the users are doing, what the users are doing and how they're interacting with your contents. If you go with qualitative analysis, you're going to understand why they're interacting with your content. So this is the what and the why. Uh, every newsroom uh, must have this function, or they must have somebody on their staff who's actually just following this kind of stuff. 
um, so, that, so that they can get better. Because like I said, uh, what you can't measure, you cannot improve. So let's try and learn about uh, the differences between these. Um, analytics cannot do this the following for you. Number one, it can't provide a complete content measurement solution, meaning that it's just part of the solution uh, or part of the toolbox that you have. It also can't provide the most accurate data, but what it can do is that it's going to uh, give you some data to work with. Uh, the reason it can't provide uh, the most accurate data, for example, is uh, uh, if you're going to, um, to have a, an ad uh, on a website and then somebody has a, an ad blocker, but they can still read your content, but they won't see your ad, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, people that read your content might be more than people that saw the ad. So that's one of the things that we talk about in terms of data cannot be super 100% accurate. Sometimes uh, analytics can also not adequately answer the why. You know, it cannot answer exactly why people interact with your content. Um, but at least you see that they are, they are on your website or they're using your app, but you might not exactly know why they're on your um, interaction with your content. Um, having said that, <clears throat> uh, what can you do? Uh, this slide got bigger somehow. <laughs> okay. Um, it can do a lot of stuff. You know, analytics does a lot of stuff for us. For example, it can measure trends, you know, uh, you can know uh, just by looking at your analytics uh, from month to month, from year to year, how your content is being viewed. So for example, I can know that last week, two people saw my, my uh, website. This week, 10 people saw my website. And then if we keep going on and on and on, we can measure that and you can graph it. You put it on a graph. Uh, that is useful uh, for you to know if your content is sticking or if it's not sticking. It can also challenge and uh, uh, validate some assumptions. So we do make uh, assumptions about people, uh, but once you look at some of this data coming in, uh, those assumptions can be either challenged or they can be validated. So data uh, is something that you need uh, for you to be able to conclusively say, uh, you know, these people are not like this because of the way they answered this question or things like that. So it's very, very important to include um, some of these uh, <clears throat> tools uh, in your content management. Um, it can also demonstrate how your content uh, meets established business goals and user needs. So um, as a content creator, you have a goal that you want to achieve. And then you also have user needs that you want to meet. And uh, using these um, analytics is going to show you uh, how your goals are being met and how the users actually uh, meeting their needs. Um, there are two types of uh, analytics. Uh, let me see, running out of time here, but uh, two types of analytics. Uh, there's a top-down analytics and then there's bottom-up analytics. Uh, top-down is basically where you come up with a very narrow set of goals and uh, use that to identify a bigger meaningful metrics. Uh, the opposite is what we call bottom-up analytics where you start without any defined goals and you're just looking at different things. Um, top-down is uh, very useful um, because it does allow you to create very targeted uh, types of uh, questions uh, or types of um, information that you want out of your analytics and so forth. So you're just not shooting, uh, shooting in the dark, so to speak. Um, I'm going to present a framework uh, that has five components to our metric, to our uh, data analytics. The first one is what we call business objectives. What is the purpose of your converged website? What is the purpose? Um, so you basically want to know your purpose, uh, having understood what your audience is, uh, what your audience wants, um, who your audience is, you know, uh, where they are and so forth in terms of geography, in terms of socioeconomic uh, status, ethnicity and so forth, then what is your purpose of your work? Uh, so we call those business objectives because uh, journalism is a business. Um, 
even though it has uh, you know, a professional obligations of being correct and so forth, it also has economic uh, obligations of keep, keep, to keep it running. Um, you know, bills being paid, people being paid their salaries and so forth. So it is a business at the end of the day. So what are the business ob objectives that you have? Um, at the bottom here of the slide, I mentioned some of the objectives that people have uh, that we've researched over time. For example, uh, brand awareness could be the objective. Improving communication and feedback uh, with the customers could be, um, could be another one. Okay, running out of time. Okay, um, I will wrap up soon. Okay, so just uh, I'll just read uh, read through the uh, the framework, and then uh, yeah, wrap up in like five minutes. Okay, so one is business objectives as part of the framework. The next one is the content goals. Uh, as in what your action, what actions do you expect uh, people to do on your content? Um, the other is KPIs. Uh, KPIs are important for everything because this is the core of the measurement. And then uh, targets, how do you rate your success? This is also part of the core of the uh, uh, of, of uh, analysis or, or analytics. And then last but not least is uh, the attributes that provide meaningful insights that you glean from your uh, analytics. So you'll be gathering um, uh, content, or you'll, be, you'll be gathering um, all this information with the purpose of mining it and coming up with meaningful insights. So I think I, I just ran out of my time here, but uh, I'll provide this uh, slideshow to uh, the organizers. Thank you, people. Sorry, I didn't go through the rest of it. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Uh, okay. first, so who do I make the uh, the host now? KMTV Liberia. Liberia, okay. Thank you. KMTV. KMTV Liberia, okay. Yes. Okay. Um, again, uh, here in the audience, we, we want you to be a little quiet for us as we now go back to Frank. Is Frank, Frank, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm okay. All right, great. Thank great. you very much, Scott. Um, the okay, presentation so was very rich. And I know my colleagues were listening keenly and uh, they may have one or two points to raise. Uh, coincidentally, I happen to be lecturing a digital journalism course this semester at the university. So uh, you raise an issue of, for example, knowing your audiences and what have you. I think that that is key. And for Liberia, before my colleagues coming, uh, we had a gap. Uh, we are not in the business of doing audience survey or audience research. So as a result, even though you mentioned empirical evidence, sometimes you can find out, but even a radio station that comes up one week ago, a few days ago, uh, tagged themselves number one. So in the vacuum of doing audience research, my own question before I go to my colleagues is how key is this? I know your society is advanced and you have some ratings agency because it's based on your ratings that you will get big, big businesses from the, the corporations and what have you. How key is audience research in determining the ratings of the various media outlet. I know with, with the internet, thanks to Google Analytics, uh, I run a website, a news website called News Public Trust. And I happen to have gone, gone on the, I mean, uh, listed with Google Analytics recently. Mm. And that has given me a very deep insight as to the content that my audiences view. And in our situation, politics is, is the reading. 
one time I, I, I published a story and within less than five minutes, I saw the, the number of views whipping up. But if you take a story, story like human interest, as uh, Dr. Gina Stifo was talking about, the views are low. And I did a comparative study with other uh, agencies or online uh, outlets in Liberia that published similar stories. And I saw the, the number of views went down. So how key is uh, audience research in determining um, the ratings of news organization or uh, news agency, news outlet, or media outlet in general. Right. So uh, that would be the first question. I don't know whether you want to take that before the others. Uh, I, I can, I can, I can ask okay. a bit. Um, so, um, so for part of this later slides that I didn't have the chance to actually, uh, discuss is about business models. And uh, depending on the business model that you have, uh, that will be the determining factor in uh, you know, how your, your station is actually uh, organized and is rated. Um, so I'm aware that, uh, for example, in Zambia, um, people would say, you know, number one registration in the city or whatever, uh, but they don't have any metrics behind it. And um, it's difficult to even know if they're actually number one, uh, because every other FM station has the same reach uh, in terms of you know, uh, geography and whatnot. Um, and uh, potentially the same number of people could be listening to all these radio stations. So uh, what I think is going to be a differentiator is the content and the consistency, uh, because the users, um, the users uh, will show you if uh, your content is not uh, something that they really appreciate. And how they show you or how you find out is uh, by doing short surveys. Um, I know um, one of my friends in South Africa was uh, doing research with community radio stations. What they did to find uh, uh, their reach or you know, their effectiveness is they went out in the community with a survey and they're just handing people the survey and people would write it down, would write down the answers and they brought back that information and uh, use that to improve their um, uh, their shows and stuff like that. Oh, was there another question? Uh, Frank, do you have another question? You got to unmute and probably yeah, take one from the audience. Any questions? Uh, question Okay. Uh, thank you again. My name is Samuel Duet, uh, member of the President of Liberia. Uh, we, our media terrain is somehow difficult. Uh, especially due to the financial constraints, you know, we call ourselves the, the handicapped media in Liberia. Where some reporter and give 15 minutes that are salary. So sometimes we got the information, we got the brains, but because of low you know, salary remuneration, so you see people are not giving out the best. So the, my question goes to uh, Alja Do you have any program that will promote the Liberian media landscape in terms of producing? Uh, development stories, of, uh, human interest stories. So what we have now, more than 85% of the stories we hear on the radio, uh, you, you read the paper, they are all about politics, they are all about entertainment, and our black newly. So do you have, uh, based on uh, the environment, you know what the development stories do to a country? Do you have any program to empower the brand media? Now, I have a personal story. My name was announced at the Development Journalist of the Year Award in 2018. That was a, a, a program by the President of Liberia. Now, up to now, I have just got my award. Now, that alone discourages journalists going to human interest stories or the various stories. Now, how can you, as our senior brother of the privileged brothers or sisters, how can you have the, the financially handicapped Liberian media 
So we can move away from the federal reporting share. It's too much as engulfed the whole media landscape. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thank you for that question. Uh, that's a big question for me. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, you know, this is what I was saying. You have to know your audience because uh, I'm, I'm not very sure uh, how the, uh, for example, public radio stations are organized uh, in Liberia, and uh, I'm going to defer to somebody with uh, maybe more knowledge about that situation. So he said the question was for Alja. So I will bring the president to my seat. Okay. Uh, quickly, yeah, uh, Mr. Joe Mason to answer the question uh, okay. regarding. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, I think I think at the level of Alja, uh, one of the things we are thinking about right now is how do we partner with the PEL uh, to encourage journalists who are doing their best and reporting on issues outside of politics. Uh, for example, can we not begin to say, we'll put aside what for a journalist who does stories around disability issues? Can we uh, encourage journalists who are reporting on issues other than politics? And I think that will encourage some of you folks, uh, especially our colleague who talked about winning the PEL award, but haven't gotten anything so far. So that is something Ada will invest into possibly, uh, giving some sort of award to uh, our colleagues out there who are doing their best, but have not been recognized because all too often, the attention gets journalists who cover in politics, who cover in those issues that people care about a lot, but the other important issues uh, like the issues around disability that we're highlighting here today that we at Alja can begin to invest in when it comes to just finding some sort of award for journalists who are engaged in those practices. That way we are encouraging journalists to invest in other areas of the profession, tell other stories, you know, human interest stories, disability, quality, uh, gender issues. So those are things that I think at our organization we can begin to highlight, just to encourage you guys who are in Liberia, who are reporting on the issues to continue to do that, knowing that when you do, you will get recognized. And, and I quickly want to add here from my vintage point as the moderator, uh, listening to the presenters, you can see here, we didn't talk anything about politics. All of the presentations here kind of went in a different. Um, so again, I'm hoping that you got these presentations. If you have one more question, uh, we'll take that question because we have our next and final speaker in queue waiting to come on. Uh, Frank, is, is there another question so we can wrap uh, uh, Dr. Musonda up? No, no question. I think we can go to the next speaker. Okay, now? Are you getting it? Yes, I'm good. I'm getting it. Good. Yeah. We can go to the next presentation. Okay. All right. So um, thank you, Frank. You can you can then mute again. Um want to thank, want to thank you all for uh, giving an audience uh, to Dr. Kapatamoyo. Let us give him a big hand clap for his presentation. Thank you so much, Doc, for coming through for Alja. We really appreciate the presentation. We hope that our folks in Liberia also uh, benefit. Again, we want to thank you for finding time in your schedule uh, to avail yourself for these uh, uh, presentations. Thank you so much. You can uh, go off now uh, from your end. Oh, uh, Again, if you yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. I'll talk to you guys later. Thank you. Right. Yes, um, if you just join us, we are live on KMTV in Liberia and online. And uh, we have many of our colleagues at the I campus on Carey Street where Frank Sinwola is facilitating 
uh, the audience there, and, and we're here in the city of Trenton, the state of New Jersey, the USA, and uh, coming through this workshop. Um, our last, of course, I always say, the, not the least, but probably the best, um, uh, is coming from uh, Jane Cudley. And uh, I'm trying to get uh, her, uh, great. Her presentation will be on media ethics and investigative journalism in the age of social media. And this is very critical at this time, considering all of the different platforms on social media that are disseminating information. Uh, Still High Center for Study of Media Ethics and Law, Hubbard School of Journalism, uh, let me just uh, go through her little quick uh, profile before we bring her on. Again, as I said, she's a professor of media ethics and law at the School of Journalism and Mass Communications at the University of Minnesota, um, where she is also the director of the Silha Center for the Study of Media Ethics and Law. She is an, an affiliated faculty member a lawyer, uh, Professor Cutley, was the executive director of the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press from 1984 to 1999. Professor Cutley writes and speaks frequently on the First Amendment and freedom of information issues and on media and legal ethics in the United States and abroad. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow colleagues, Liberia in the U.S., we want to welcome with a rousing applause for Professor as she makes her presentation. Thank you. And uh, I do need to share my screen, please. So if you can make me a co-host. Yes. Yeah, we're going to give you co-host uh, authorization. You, you already got that. So try and see. Okay, I didn't know if you had done that or not. Let me see if I can find my presentation here. Are you seeing it? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this uh, important conference. Um, the title I was given is this, Media Ethics and Investigative Journalism in the Age of Social Media. And I'm going to talk about some current controversies that have arisen here in the United States, but which I think have universal uh, application. Uh, these are all issues that journalists that are using social media face. My focus is gonna be on ethics rather than law, but um, of course I am a lawyer. So um, I hope we'll have some time for some questions and I'll be happy to try to address uh, legal questions as well if any of those come up. Okay, so um, I'm gonna start with what I think is the fundamental um, question, which is, should the old media ethics standards apply in a new media environment? I mean, it's funny to be calling social media new media because it's certainly not very new now, but it's interesting how so many of these debates seem to revolve around the notion that social media and other forms of old, old online media are somehow new and require a whole new set of standards and guidelines. And I don't really agree with that. I've fought back against it in both ethics and law because I think good journalistic standards apply regardless of platform. Um, some of us are old enough to remember with the advent of television news and then uh, satellite news and things like that, that there was a, an outcry in many countries to change the regulatory framework. And that also happened as journalists started to communicate digitally. We had a big lawsuit here in the United States now many years ago that went to the Supreme Court that asked the question of whether speech online got the same protection under our First Amendment as speech in the printed word. And the US Supreme Court ultimately held, I'm happy to say, that it did. That's not a universally held view, but practically, I think it's become the view because as we know, digital media, difficult to harness, difficult to regulate, at least singling it out in any way that would be different from old media. 
So when we talk about social media, at least in the United States, but I think this is true everywhere, because I did a similar program when I was on my Fulbright in Latvia, and these same issues came up at that time. The so-called legacy media, traditional news media, whether we're talking about the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Associated Press, I'm going to give you some specific examples of that. Traditionally, I think, view journalists' social media interactions in kind of a uh, schizophrenic way. Um, on the one hand, they encourage their journalists to have uh, high visibility on Twitter, on Facebook, Instagram, and whatever other platform you want to name. But there's a problem with that, or at least several problems with that. One is that I think the legacy media traditionally view journalists' social media interactions as a reflection on and an extension of their employers. In other words, if you're a journalist for, let's say, the Washington Post, and you've got a Twitter handle, and you're active on Facebook and other forms of social media, the Washington Post is going to say, you're always a journalist for us. You can never get away from that. So anything you do or say reflects back on us. Therefore, in many cases, those news organizations will say that social media is not a place for personal or political opinions. It's simply another platform for the journalist's professional work. And as the previous speaker alluded to, these days, journalists who perhaps traditionally would have been print reporters and wouldn't have to worry about things like taking photographs or shooting video or recording audio, they now have to do that because all of those forms of media are now being hosted on their news organization's platforms or on their own personal um, platforms, whether it's a, a video blog or, or just a regular blog or whatever it might be. But again, if the legacy media have as a standard that journalists are not supposed to express personal or political opinions, and of course here I'm not talking about people that write columns or, or doing editorial work, I'm talking about people that are, are reporting straight news. But if it's their view that they shouldn't be expressing personal or political opinions, then they would say they shouldn't be doing it in uh, social media either. And then I think probably the most confounding part about this is that legacy media, even though they want you to have that visibility, they want you to build your brand, they see it as inherently risky. There are certainly legal risks, which we can talk about if you want to, but focusing on ethics, I would say the risk is that the journalist could be perceived as biased, which would undermine the news organization's objectivity and ultimately its credibility. So we have this mixed message coming from the legacy media, and I think it makes journalists work very difficult. It's hard to thread the needle under these circumstances. So what I've got here are some excerpts from the Washington Post uh, policies and standards for social media. And I'm not, not going to read them all to you. I'll share these notes with the host later. But as you see, they emphasize the fact that when you're using social networks, whether for reporting or for your own personal life, you are expected to protect professional integrity and remember that the Washington Post journalists are always Washington Post journalists. So you never shed your identity as a journalist for the Washington Post. That has implications. And as they say here, social media accounts that are maintained by the Post journalists reflect upon the reputation and credibility of the newsroom, even though you can be more perhaps more personal and informal, that you must be ever mindful of preserving the reputation of the Washington Post for journalistic excellence, fairness, and independence. Every comment or leak we share should be considered public information, regardless of privacy settings, which is, is an important point to make. And several of these guidelines that I'll be talking about make this too, and I always emphasize it as a lawyer. Regardless of the privacy settings you use, you can never assume that anything you post in social media is going to remain private. That's just the reality of it. And you're fooling yourself if you think that you actually can keep it um, to only a small circle of selected friends. It's, it's not going to happen. Then they have their proscription here, which is that post journalists must refrain from writing, tweeting, or posting anything, including photographs or video, 
that could objectively be perceived as reflecting political, racial, sexist, religious, or other bias or favoritism. Again, the very concerned about journalists expressing viewpoints that might reflect badly on the post because they would appear to be biased or bigoted or otherwise discriminatory. The New York Times has another set of social media guidelines. Again, I'm, this is not all of them. I'm just giving you a few selected examples. They emphasize that in their social media posts, journalists might not express partisan opinions, promote political views, endorse candidates, make offensive comments, or do anything that undercuts the Times' journalistic reputation. And some people would say that that pretty much eviscerates your ability to be yourself um, in social media. But again, the Times view is you're always a Times journalist, and your posts must reflect the Times editorial standard. They said you have to be especially mindful of appearing to take sides on an issue that the Times is trying to cover objectively. I mean, I would think in this country, for example, a great example, some great examples of that would be the debates over vaccination for COVID, the debates over masking, um, the debates over the uh, new abortion law in Texas. I mean, all those things are the kinds of things that I think the Times would say they don't want you expressing an opinion on because the Times is trying to cover them from an objective and independent viewpoint. They also emphasize that this applies to whatever your department you're in. So even if you're a sports reporter, you cannot engage in commentary on these public issues according to this policy. Um, and then they consider that all social media activity comes under this policy, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, or anything else. And they add that anything you post or even like online, and I would add retweet, um, is to some degree public, and everything we do in public is likely to be associated with the Times. And then I just wanted to mention this one because it's going to come up in just a second. If you feel threatened by someone on social media, please inform your supervisors immediately. They have policy in place to protect the safety of our journalists. And as you know, uh, Although certainly posting reporting in conventional ways can give rise to criticism and even threats, I think it's fair to say that the anonymity that people frankly hide behind in social media sometimes makes them much more unhinged for lack of a better term. And we have seen some really ugly attacks on journalists. Um, and I'll talk about that more in just a second. Um, then I've got here the Associated Press. Um, these media guidelines, again, these are just uh, excerpts. They encourage staffers to be active participants in social networks, but they need to uphold the fundamental value that staffers should not express personal opinions on controversial issues of the day. And they go on with some specificity to say, you have to identify yourself as being from the Associated Press. You don't have to include AP in your Twitter or other usernames. Um, and you shouldn't use an AP logo, but you should always identify yourself in your profile as an AP staffer. And I know that some years ago, there was a lot of debate about people setting up basically fake Facebook accounts or joining um, other groups, um, sort of um, either under false names or at least not revealing that they were journalists. And under AP's rule, that would not be acceptable. Even if you were saying you were doing it for investigative journalism, they would say that's not consistent with their policy. Opinions they express, again, could damage the AP's reputation, so they must be uh, refrained from commenting on public issues that are contentious and must not take part in organized action in support of causes or movements. Um, this is a controversial point, not just for AP. Many major news organizations in the US have um, requirements like this. And some journalists, frankly, are uh, bothered by that because they would say that just because I'm a journalist doesn't mean I give up my right to be a citizen, an active citizen of the country and, and lend my name and support to causes that matter to me. Um, but that's not what the AP wants its staffers to do. Uh, privacy, again, uh, any opinions or personal information may be linked to AP. Um, even if you restrict your pages to viewing only by friends, privacy is, is really an illusion in social media. And if, if that's the only takeaway you have from my talk today, I hope you have that one. Um, as a lawyer and somebody that works a lot in data privacy, I have to tell you there is no privacy in social media. So don't delude yourself into thinking there is. 
they talk a little bit about friending and following and the previous speaker spoke a little bit about political candidates. Um, they say it's fine to accept uh, Facebook requests from sources, but friending and liking political candidates um, could make people think that um, an AP staffer is actually advocates of that. So they should try to make this kind of contact with figures on both sides of controversial issues. And this, of course, is part of the very you know, contentious argument about what objectivity is, whether objectivity is even desirable. And if objectivity or independence really requires you to always look at both sides, um, is it possible that there might be some uh, controversies on which there really is only one credible side, but are you nevertheless required to go out and find the other side and friend them or join their group as well? Again, this is something, uh, this is a, a point that AP has been really um, adamant about for many, many years. Some are suggesting that that's an idea that's time has become, uh, has become outmoded. Um, they obviously encourage you to link to AP content um, and the New York Times and the Washington Post say the same thing. Um, retweeting should not be written in a way that looks like you're expressing a personal opinion on the issues of the day. If you don't comment on it when you retweet it, it can easily be seen as a sign of approval of what you're relaying. And I think that actually is a good caution to have for anybody um, because just retweeting um, you know, I, without a comment does, I think for most people, imply that you're endorsing it. Um, if you add something that says, look at what this idiot is saying or whatever, then, then it's pretty clear you're not endorsing it. But for most people, if you've retweeted it, without comment, they're probably going to assume that you agree with it or support it. And that isn't just a viewpoint kind of issue. It also could have to do with retweeting something that's factually wrong and you become part of the disinformation campaign, which none of us would want to do. Um, then they talk about sourcing if you're relying upon social networks. As all of you know, it's difficult to verify uh, the identity of sources found on social networks. <coughs> And so if, you, if that's where you're doing your reporting, and of course many of us do, then you need to vet them in exactly the same way you would anybody else. Um, people are not always what they seem, and it's very easy to disguise who you are on social media. So that's, I think, certainly a, a legitimate caution that I would endorse. And then they talk about interacting with users, and there's, there are elements of this in the New York Times and the Washington Post guidelines too, um, they encourage engagement with people on social media, but they say it's best to avoid back and forth exchanges with angry people. Um, and as you know, it can, that can easily snowball into just a kind of a pointless, um, he said, she said, kind of ranting and raving. And then they go on to say that if you're dealing with abusive, bigoted, obscene, or racist comments, you should flag them for the AP's so-called nerve center um, and their AP global security operation. And then the last two things, and this is, this is also from AP, just to be clear, um, that any response made to a reader or viewer could go public. Um, they may feel like private communications, but they easily find their ways to blogs, pressure groups, attorneys, governments, and others. Um, if a story is stir stirring up a significant controversy, they suggest that the editor, rather than the journalist who posted it, might be the best person to reply. And any incoming message that raises the possibility of legal action should be reviewed by an AP attorney before a response is made. Again, that is good advice in the old world of uh, media. Uh, a journalist gets an angry phone call, a journalist gets an angry email, um, it is always wise if they're threatening any kind of legal action to make sure you talk to an attorney before you reply. Uh, the attorney might decide to be the one to reply, your editor might reply, they might tell you to reply in an innocuous way, but whatever it is, if, if somebody's threatening to sue you uh, for libel or invasion of privacy or something like that, um, you better talk to somebody in your management before you um, go forward with a reply. And then finally, um, this is a code of ethics that I found online earlier this week. I hadn't seen it before. Um, it is based on the code of ethics for the Norwegian press, because I wanted to show you something that didn't come from the United States. And these are not really what, I mean, some of them are ethical points. Uh, some of them are an assertion of, of 
right to freedom of expression, what's your right to voice your opinion, and then again, good, uh, you know, good suggestions and, and good directions to be critical of everything, including yourself, to use your power to protect, to tell the truth at all times, to make clear that an opinion is an opinion, not a statement. Um, state your allegiances to stay independent. I mean, this is the same notion that comes up in things like the Society of Professional Journalist Code of Ethics, which says that if you've got um, something that might be perceived as a conflict of interest, you need to disclose that. Uh, reveal your sources, again, always a good practice unless doing so can harm them. Be critical of the sources, independently verify, give credit where credit is due. In other words, don't just steal somebody else's copy and not explain where it came from. And remember, from a copyright perspective, um, just because it's out there doesn't mean it's there for you to use freely. Um, copyright law still applies on the internet. In the United States, we have something called Section 230, which gives an awful lot of protection to um, social media platforms. But one area it doesn't protect you is in copyright violation. And if a platform hosts, uh, knowingly hosts uh, copyrighted material without the copyright holder's consent, they can be sued in this country. And, and uh, that's why YouTube and other platforms take things down if somebody uh, asserts that um, this was copyrighted material republished without permission. Even attributing it by itself is not the same as getting permission. So be careful about that. Um, it says preserve the intended meaning of a given statement. Of course, that means not to take things out of context. I would include with that not just statements, but photographs, video. You don't want to edit them in a way that could be misleading. Um, give your opponent a chance to respond. That's always a uh, good practice in journalism and admit and correct your mistakes immediately. But then I have to ask ourselves, is it really that simple? I mean, this all seems fairly straightforward. Uh, Barbara Allen, who's at Pointer uh, in Florida here in the United States, has made the assertion that up and coming journalists are increasingly balking when they inform that according to the industry, their race and gender identity are political issues. Um, and that that means that they can't talk about them or that because of their race and gender identity, they are precluded from covering certain kinds of stories. Um, for many emerging journalists, issues labeled by met legacy media as political are simply the facts of their existence. So we're getting some pushback here, and I think the newer generations of journalists are probably not going to be as passive about this as uh, perhaps their predecessors were. And I'm going to give you two examples of cases uh, that occurred here in the United States that I think illustrate this point. One involved uh, Lauren Wool. She was an award-winning freelance editor working at the New York Times. Um, when President-elect Joe Biden's plane landed at Andrews Air Force Base before his inauguration, she tweeted that it gave her chills. She also tweeted that the Trump administration had been childish for not sending a plane for the new administration. She later learned that Biden actually chose to use his own plane. He didn't want Trump's plane, he didn't ask for Trump's plane. He wasn't angry that he didn't get to use Trump's plane. So she deleted the tweet. She just deleted it. And that, you know, again, would not be consistent with some of these guidelines we talked about where you don't just delete it, you correct it. You know, it's an old principle of libel law that even if you take something down or retract something, there's always going to be a portion of the population that will have seen your original publication and never saw the correction. And so good practice would be to correct as well as perhaps to delete an erroneous tweet. Well, what happened after her uh, tweet was that a variety of critics started criticizing her on Twitter and pointed to that to say, this illustrates the anti-conservative bias among the media in the United States. You know, they all hated Trump. They all love Biden. And, you know, here's a reporter saying she got chills when she saw Biden's plane land. And, and she meant that in a very positive way. Um, these criticisms were characterized as a concerted campaign against both her and the Times. In addition to the criticism, which, you know, might have been justified, she was also harassed online. And the harassment included obscene, misogynistic, and homophobic language. She was also stalked in the real world and received death threats. She was terminated by the Times. 
Um, there was a big story about this in Vanity Fair magazine. And uh, according to that, the Times management had actually had issues with Wolf and her social media activity before. And they had told her to be more cautious. When she was let go, she was told that her name and the Times were in the headlines on all over the place, and we can't have that. Um, a spokesperson for the, the Times said there's a lot of inaccurate information circulating on Twitter. We don't get into personal matters, but we can say that we didn't end someone's employment over a single tweet. Um, so their point was that this was maybe just the coup de grace here. It was not the first instance. It was a continuing problem um, with uh, Ms. Wolf. Um, there was a rehire Lauren hashtag on Twitter. Many prominent journalists came to her defense, and one example uh, was Felicia Sanmez, who is a Washington Post reporter who has filed her own discrimination lawsuit against the newspaper, allegedly for um, their decisions about not letting her cover certain types of stories, um, specifically on uh, sexual harassment issues. She said, knee jerk findings in response to online harassment campaigns only further embolden the harassers and put all journalists at risk. So her point was that in her view, the New York Times had capitulated to this online harassment rather than standing behind their reporter. Similar story involved Emily Wilder, who was a news associate at the AP in Phoenix. Uh, she was violated for terminations of the AP's social media policy, which we talked about a little earlier. She questioned in her in tweet the basic terms we use to report news, such as using Israel but never Palestine or war but not siege and occupation. She claimed that these were political choices and that, in fact, AP was not being as objective as they claimed to be by making these choices. Two days before she was fired, a Twitter post uh, was made by the Stanford University Republicans, a student group um, on Stanford University, which criticized her saying she had been an anti-Israel agitator while she was on campus. And they posted a story she had written for the college newspaper calling conservative, controversial conservative uh, Ben Shapiro a little turd. Um, she's Jewish, by the way, just for the record. But nevertheless, she was abled as, labeled as anti-Israel. Um, her former journalism professor at Stanford says that the tweet was really a pretext to, to fire her. She said it was really her past activism. And she posed the question, what happens if you were a college activist and then decide you want to become a journalist? Does this mean you can't have been an activist and then be a journalist? So these are you know, really, I think, critical questions about journalists' ability to kind of maintain uh, who they really are and nevertheless comply with their news organization standards. Um, another person at Pointer asks these questions, which I think are important ones. Can you as a journalist weigh in on certain issues um, with your opinions and yet still be trusted to report with facts, fairness, and context? In other words, is it possible to be a um, objective, independent journalist, um, even if you are weighing in on uh, a number of controversial issues. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a huge question uh, you know, of whether um, full disclosure is sufficient to uh, deal with the problem. The um, Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics has suggested that it will go a long way to solve the pro problem. But of course, it does open up the question of how much scrutiny journalists have to expect for their personal views and their personal lives. I mean, if you're a political columnist, that's one thing. But suppose you know you you report on sports or gardening or something like that. Um, is it the reader's business to know what your political viewpoints might be? Are those relevant? Is that something that the reader or viewer or other consumer of news has a right to know? And then um, are journalists, particularly journalists of color who have had certain life experiences, and he includes in that sexual assault, um, perhaps experiencing police brutality or being a victim or knowing a victim of gun violence, are you expected to erase who they are left out the word are there, for the sake of appearing objective. In other words, and this came up in uh, the example of Felicia Sanmez, if you are a victim of sexual assault, does that mean you can never report on it? Could you not, for example, report on 
um, the Senate or the, the Senate hearings on the confirmation of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh, who was accused of sexual assault. If you had that in your background, would you not be allowed to cover it because the argument would be that you're biased? So I have some questions for discussion, and I'd like to open it up to your comments and question that Barbara Allen at Pointer poses is, what role do you believe your personal social media posts play in your professional development? And I would add to that question, what role does your employer think that they should play? Um, does your employer have similar rules like the ones at the Post and the New York Times and the AP, or do they take more of a laissez-faire attitude? Who is reading your posts now? Who is your audience? And I think that's a really great question too, because obviously you don't actually control who's going to look at your, your blog or your Facebook page unless you've got privacy settings enabled um, or your Twitter feeds. But you probably, if you check them, and I'm sure you do, have some sense of who your audience is. And I'm not sure that that question, you know, depending on how you answer it, that that solves all these questions, but it does raise uh, the issue of whether your typical audience member already knows a lot about you, uh, is already knowledgeable about the topics on which you are tweeting or writing, or whether they're coming in kind of cold and don't know who you are, what your perspective is, or what the underlying facts would be. You know, in Twitter, I think particularly, we often assume a level of knowledge that may or may not be accurate. What obligation do you have to that audience? I mean, I think the things that, that were listed in some of these guidelines about being truthful, being accurate, disclosing your sources and less, uh, disclosing them would endanger them, um, being careful not to be used by any faction, whether it's political, ideological, corporate, whatever it is, um, your duty is to your public. Um, obviously, you have a duty to your employer too, but your duty should not be um, basically to promote a politician or to promote a particular viewpoint, um, I would say, if it's going to be to the detriment of the public interest. Which brings us back to the question, which is kind of fundamental of what is your purpose or goal as you're posting? Is it simply to create a brand? Is that you want to be retweeted? Is that you want to, you know, uh, be higher in uh, the Google searches or whatever that might be? Is that your goal? Or is your goal more related to journalism in the classic sense of trying to inform the public of accurate information about things they need to know? And then finally, how do you think your posts will age? I think this is a great question, even though Barbara Allen really posted it in the context of young journalists and journalists who are still in, in, in journalism school. But I think it's a question every single one of us should ask. Um, you know, these things exist in the internet forever, as far as we know. Even if you take them down, there's a record of them somewhere. So if you write something, um, either let's say it's, we're talking about a news report, for example, where you're, you're, you feel you're under pressure to post something very quickly, but perhaps you haven't taken the time to verify it. There are many spectacular examples of journalists who posted erroneous information, not deliberately, but because they rushed to do something and they didn't take time to confirm. So there's that issue. And then there's also the question about commentary. Um, you know, the, the story of the, of the reporter who was an activist at Stanford reminds us that things that we posted many years ago may come back to haunt us. So as you're thinking about posting, I guess that would be my final comment. Think before you post. It's very tempting to reflexively post right away um, in the desire to be there first or to uh, weigh in on something that you think is important. But I think a few minutes of reflection could serve you very well in the future because again, these posts will never really go away and you wanna be comfortable with being able to live with them in the future. If you make a mistake and everybody makes a mistake, the key is to correct it and make sure that that's part of the social media content too. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, I'm happy to take questions or comments about uh, these or um, anything else that's related to uh, posting on social media. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kirtley. Uh, we want to thank you for coming through for Alja. Um, we believe your presentation is, is one that we can learn from, especially when it comes to the legal ramifications that involve some of what we do. 
So I will now go back to Monrovia. Uh, if Frank is there, uh, Frank, can you unmute and uh, engage uh, our speaker? Uh, we're running out of time. And so if you can... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think I will stop sharing my screen question i hope okay we have one there and then i'll try to make it short i understand some of the text text there and said we're making the questions to me okay uh go ahead uh, thank you uh professor Ketley, for your presentation uh, my name is yeah, yeah. Hey, my name is Samuel Kwe. Uh, I'm a Liberian journalist, freelance journalist, and a member of the press union of Liberia, Liberia and Journalist Umbrella. Uh, you said something very important as well. Uh, an, a a one-way editor who name when even the mother of very person because of her uh, uh, opinion. Now, my question is, can uh, journalism and whether Facebook or social media or something, can it be evolved of controversy? But there is no way for me, my, my personal opinion, that somebody will always pressing. You have to highlight the limitation, the, uh, the uh, the limitation of somebody in a uh, uh, disparity. And I'm just one of the companies that says, but also proper solution to the problem. Because I always say, you cannot accuse Mr. X or Mr. Y when you don't have solution to the problem that is being discussed. Uh, so that's it. So for example now, uh, I wrote about the problem in Liberia. In recent time, I did an article on uh, the, uh, our president who, who won the world best footballer. But now the Confederation of African Football uh, disqualified Liberia's international sport page, commonly called Samir Khan Sport Complex, and it doing the, the presidency of a world former best footballer, so who played in all the best football field. Now, can you, can, cannot be devoid of controversy? That's what I'm saying, because whether you love it or not, people will always say their comment and opinion. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, um, unfortunately, you, you broke up a little bit, but I'm going to try to answer this. I think, think you were asking. Um, um, but I, I, think, I think what you were aiming at uh, was the question of whether it's, it's okay to engage in controversial reporting, which necessarily would include um, a, uh, you know, expression of a viewpoint. Um, Frank, can you, can you mute on your end, Frank? Uh, uh, Professor Cutler, please, please hold. Just mute while she responds. Okay. Um, so anyway, as I was saying, I, I'm not sure I, I could hear the whole question because you, you broke up and froze a couple of times. But I think what you were talking about was, you know, as a freelancer in particular, and you're going to be covering controversial subjects and, and your you know, method of reporting includes uh, commentary on controversial issues. And again, I think, you know, the, the uh, guidelines that I cited to you with the possible exception of the one that was based on the Norwegian ethics would draw a distinction between, um, you know, those who write opinion columns versus those who are straight, straight news reporters. One of the challenges, and this is certainly not limited to social media, that we all face today is the question of whether um, when we're doing analytical pieces, which can help our readers to understand, um, you know, what the big picture is about a controversy and so forth, almost out of necessity, we're going to be approaching that with a point of view. Uh, we're going to choose who we're going to talk about, uh, who we're going to cite, who we're going to quote. And I think for a lot of people, as I said earlier, there's this sense that why should I have to give equal time to somebody who has some crackpot theory or is proposing something that is really offensive? You know, it's racist, it's misogynistic, you know, whatever it might be. I shouldn't have to include their comments in order to have some kind of um, 
ideal of balance because that really gives credibility to sides with which I don't agree. Now, I think, you know, the, the, the point would be, I, you know, what is your personal way of reporting? Um, is it your view? I mean, is it your approach that you're going to give your opinions throughout? In which case, you know, essentially what you are is an opinion columnist, the equivalent of that. And certainly opinion columnists, you know, we, we want them to express their viewpoint. We want them to look at these issues and, and synthesize them for the reader or viewer. But I think the key here, and boy, isn't this a point of debate these days, is drawing the distinction between factual reporting and opinion. And even if those two things are blended, and I know in some cultures and some organizations, it's fine for them to be, but I guess my one piece of advice would be that it's absolutely imperative that you be certain that the factual basis for the opinion that you're providing is accurate, or at least as accurate as you can make it be. Because at least under the United States' law, um, you get protection, virtually absolute protection for the expression of pure, pure opinion. But the court here defines opinion as something that can't be proven to be true or false. The underlying facts presumably can be proven true or false. And if you get those wrong, particularly if you do it carelessly or even deliberately, then in the United States, that opinion would no longer enjoy constitutional protection. So we want to encourage opinions. And, and I don't want this to come away by saying nobody should express an opinion. My cautionary comment though, is that if you do work for a news organization, you need to be very certain that the news organization is comfortable with you doing that. Because again, um, where there are really clear lines of demarcation, where it's obvious that a columnist, for example, the Washington Post, they have a number of conservatives who write columns for them. I don't think anybody in their right mind thinks that the Washington Post editorial board necessarily agrees with those viewpoints, but they include it to have greater diversity of viewpoints. And so that's fine. But the point is that a big news organization does not want someone who is a straight news reporter to be expressing viewpoints that might reflect back on the organization, either suggesting that that's their viewpoint or that um, the organization would endorse that view and, and tailor its coverage based on um, those editorial comments. So in other words, as all of those uh, examples I gave you kept saying, you never stop being a journalist, period. And then you never stop being a journalist affiliated with a news organization for which you work. If you work for a lot of different organizations as a freelancer, then I think it's even trickier um, and probably a good idea to find out what kind of policies they have and whether they believe that they should be enforced against those that are not part of their regular staff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kirtley. We have a, uh, one question here in the American audience. So Frank, we'll come back to you. Uh, Mr. Joey Kennedy. I uh, have a question for you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, th thank you so much. Um, th thanks for your presentation, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Kirtley. Um, as, as you may be aware, social and um, social or new media is an easy and effective mode of information dissemination across the, the globe. Um, and as opposed to the United States and other countries around the world where there are rigid and enforceable laws uh, and policies, there are other countries around the world where um, laws and regulatory mechanisms are not as effective as, as they are you know, in Western countries. Um, so as a result, people go on the, you know, use social media platforms to disseminate uh, information. And sometimes they falter, they make some wild misleading, uh, you know, allegations against uh, individuals and institutions. So um, as a lawyer uh, and as a specialist in this field, what mechanisms, what measures do you think can be instituted to ensure that there are the regulatory uh, mechanisms in countries where you know the 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 other are non-existent laws or uh, enforcement mechanisms are very remote and weak. You know that that's a really great and very complex question because you're absolutely right that you know in the United States we have the First Amendment, which provides powerful protection 
uh, for anybody that's using social media, not just journalists. And um, again, as I mentioned before, the protect protection for opinions is, is so strong that it's almost impossible to successfully sue somebody for expressing a controversial viewpoint. But I think what you're raising the question about is disinformation. And I use the word disinformation rather than misinformation. Uh, that some might say it's a distinction without a difference, but for me, disinformation means something that you're deliberately putting out there as a falsehood. You know it's not true and you're putting it out there anyway. I mean, no responsible journalist obviously should do that. Again, we sometimes make mistakes and inaccurately put something out, but it's our obligation um, for, as, as a professional standard to correct that as soon as, as we can. And I think that's an appropriate thing to do. How to deal with the misinformation problem, or disinformation problem is, is a huge issue in countries that have less robust protections for freedom of speech and press. And during uh, the beginning of the COVID pandemic, and it's still happening, um, we saw a number of countries enact laws specifically geared against what they characterized as misinformation or disinformation about COVID, about the disease, about vaccination, about how transmissible it was, all that kind of thing. And again, one can understand why a government would say it's in our interest to protect the public from false statements. You know, I, I mean, obviously, who, who can disagree with the idea that governments should, should try to protect the public from bad information that's being put out either deliberately or just through ignorance. But what we've seen in a number of countries, Philippines is one example, but there are many others, is that these laws have been used to stifle journalists who effectively are criticizing government policy, for example, or questioning government statistics, uh, calling into question how, how straightforward the government is being, whether the government itself is engaging in misinformation. So it's used as basically a cudgel to beat down journalists who are simply doing their best to hold government accountable and to question what those in authority are doing. So I personally am very, very wary of disinformation and misinformation laws. European Union has been working on this. Again, it's, it's happening in mature democracies, developing democracies, autocratic societies. Everybody's trying to figure out how to deal with this problem of misinformation, especially, I think, although certainly not exclusively, in situations where actors from other countries are coming into another country and using social media platforms to try to control uh, debate and information. I wish I had an answer to all of these questions. If I did, I would probably be making a lot more money than I am in my job teaching at the University of Minnesota. Um, I fall back on the idea, number one, that it's dangerous for government to ask, act as the censor. And so I do not support these laws that give governments a pretext to shut down those who criticize them, um, including reporters who are simply calling into question uh, policies that they think are causing problems, hurting people, you know, not, not serving the public interest. I think that's really dangerous. Although I recognize, again, this interest that government has in trying to ensure that the public only gets truthful information, the problem is who's going to decide what is true, especially in some of these still developing highly debated topics. I mean, you know, we still don't know the whole story about COVID. We still don't know the whole story about vaccination. All of those things are developing, and, and our friends who are scientists would tell you that that's the nation of scientific inquiry. Um, and I am very reluctant to have governments set themselves up as the arbiters of truth, whether it's about COVID or anything else. And if it's not going to be the government, if we're talking about the executive branch, if it's not going to be the legislature, the parliament, if it's not going to be the judiciary, you know, who's going to do it? Who's going to be the mechanism? You know, some of the books by people like Orwell and others used to talk about the establishment of a ministry of truth. And I think some versions of that actually exist in some countries. As somebody who's you know, born and raised and educated in the United States, that is really troubling to me because the government, in my experience, cannot be trusted to always tell you the truth, much less to determine what the truth is. So I'm against government intervention in that way. Um, in terms of legal remedies in the United States, our libel laws are really not intended to deal with falsehoods 
full stop. They're intended to deal with falsehoods that also harm somebody's reputation. So if you're spreading false information, again, about something like COVID, the likelihood is that that's not really harming anybody's reputation. It's interesting that what's been happening here in the area of the whole discussion about voter fraud in the last election, um, a lot of people believe that President Trump and his supporters were purposely spreading false information about how good the voting machines were. There was just a story within the last day or so about what Trump knew about that when he was issuing these statements. But there really was no mechanism to do anything about that until the voting machine company, Dominion, decided that they could sue because they claimed that saying that um, the, the machines didn't work properly or were rigged to uh, throw the election to President Biden, that that was actually defaming them. It was defaming, it was, it was saying what they said was false about the quality of the voting machines that they were operating. So I'm watching with great interest to see how these various libel suits that have been brought in this country that are essentially trade libel suits where the corporation is saying, you know, you're saying, you know, we were, you know, working with the Biden administration to falsify votes, that's saying we're not acting honorably, um, that our business is not reliable and trustworthy, and that's liable, and we're going to sue you. So it could be that that will be the way, uh, kind of through the back door, that some of this disinformation uh, will be subject to judicial scrutiny. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll take one last question from Liberia and we'll be wrapping up. Uh, so Frank, if you can unmute, take one last question. Uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, Professor Cutler, my name is Ronald Church. Uh, a Labrena legislative reporter from the uh, Labrena National Legislative Chair. Uh, going through your presentation, one, uh, one paragraph of the presentation, you said our uh, journalists should restrain from posting, from tweeting, and uh, from uploading video because uh, this might come in conflict with, uh, with a newsroom. Now, I'm asking this question because aside from being a journalist, I'm also a blogger and a YouTuber, something that I have to blog, post every day. So now, what advice do you have for someone like me who is a, a journalist and also a blogger and a YouTuber? OK, thank you very much. And we thank Dr. Kelly. But I'd like to close by Asking that fairly, um, even with the advent of social media, um, does journalism ethics still remain supreme? Social. Okay, I'm, a, I'm afraid again that um, the connection wasn't very good, so I couldn't hear everything that was said. In response, well, to, the, in, in response to the question- It's a connection I like to see. Oh, okay. Rooting for ethics always, with or without internet. So from your own presentation, can I safely conclude that essence of the social media, professionalism, ethics remains relevant? Absolutely. I mean, I, as I said at the very beginning of my remarks, I've never bought into the idea that just because we have a new platform for communicating that we should completely revise our ethical codes. The code principle, I'm sorry, the, the core principles of ethics, accuracy, you know, seeking the truth and reporting it, acting independently, exposing uh, your conflicts of interest if you have any, verifying. Um, and even the Society of Professional Journalists in the United States would say, you know, calling out other journalists who are not acting ethically, all those things will still apply in the social media environment. When I look at those policies from the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Associated Press and groups like that, 
what I see is management that is really nervous about losing control over what their journalists are doing because they buy into this idea that everything their journalists do reflects back on them. And to a certain extent, that is absolutely true. Um, if you're engaged in journalism and you're known to be a reporter for the Washington Post or the New York Times, it's going to become, as happened in a couple of these examples I gave you, seen as uh, reflective on the news organization's own policies, maybe their own beliefs. If you're an independent journalist, then I think you have to think very carefully about you know, what your brand is. Um, do you want to be known as somebody who is a independent journalist whose business is reporting news and information that the public needs to know and whose highest loyalty is to that public? Or do you want to be seen as essentially a public relations arm for a particular faction, whether it's a political party or um, uh, an advocacy group, an NGO, something like that? I've always believed that there's nothing dishonorable about being a public relations person, but I think those, that's a very, very different mission than for journalists. Because if you're public relations, if you're affiliated with a group for whom you're being an advocate, that's your brand, really. But if your brand is to be a journalist, then you have to always put at the top of your consideration everything you write, everything you post. How will this serve the public interest? And if the answer is that it won't or that it promotes some other interest or faction above that, then I would really ask you to examine very carefully what your motive is for doing that and maybe whether you need to redefine yourself. All right, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Kirtley. We want to thank you for coming through um, to make your presentation. Yeah, I think a lot of us have learned uh, regarding the ethics around what we do in this noble profession. And I'm sure the folks in Liberia uh, will agree that they've learned a lot. So we want to give you a round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Um, so, uh, Frank, I will come back to you so you can just uh, tell us the mood. Um, and as we wrap up from your end, uh, just tell us what you think so far and, and how much has it benefited you guys out there in Monrovia? Thank you very much to my colleagues and uh, all the presenters. Apart from the technical breaches at the beginning, I think it went very well. And uh, uh, Monrovia is good, and I hope my colleagues here have taken a brilliant caution advice from Professor Kermode. Uh, so when we are doing our Facebook and Twitter posts, we must remember that we're doing it as a journalist. Thank you very much, and thanks to President Joe Mason and his uh, uh, team of officials. Congratulations and happy anniversary. Thank you, Frank. I'll bring the president in, Honorable Joe Mason, uh, with a word or two. Uh, th thank you so much. Uh, at our end, I want to say thank you to, to everyone who was involved in this process. Uh, Professor Kirtley, you are still on, so I want to say thank you to you. This is this not is your not first rodeo with Aja. You've done this before, and you can be assured that we'll be reaching out to you again at some point in the future. We're so grateful for uh, everything you've done. Thank you very, very much. To our colleagues uh, in Monrovia, thank you for staying engaged in this process. Uh, your questions were wonderful. Uh, your comments were very insightful. Uh, we are Aja. We please. Uh, that this process meant that much to you. Our expectation is that you are much more informed, uh, you're much more educated as journalists today in the way we walk in that building. And you can be assured that this is something we will continue to do in the future. So thank you all so much uh, for coming. Uh, I also want to uh, say thank you to some of the other folks who were involved in this process uh, to uh, Frank, our facilitator in Monrovia, Frank, uh, we're grateful for 
and everything you continue to do for Alja and for facilitating in Monrovia. So uh, we'll give more resource development committee uh, for overseeing uh, this process, guys. Uh, I thank you all so much. I also want to say thank you to the PR. Uh, they were instrumental in selecting the journalists. Uh, we we'll start through this section to our folks at the PR. PR can say thank you. Thank you. Also, Amon Rubia is our representative in Liberia, Mr. Charles Crawford. Charles, thank you. This is another happy to have uh, your help and your effort. Uh, we are grateful and we want to acknowledge you today. Uh, we also want to say thank you to the folks at KMTV, so Mr. Malcolm Joseph and uh, uh, folks at CMS, uh, of course, we know we can always count on your support. Uh, so this is definitely Jackson Baker, who are also instrumental. I remember her year, her year uh, in Trent, New Jersey. She walked behind the scene to put this up. Thank you so much. And Colonel Shelton, uh, our MC, uh, thank you, sir, uh, for uh, bringing this all together. Uh, our uh, convention continues uh, this afternoon for folks who are listening and following social media. This, this afternoon, we are over uh, in uh, Atlantic City. Uh, the group goes to Atlantic City. We come back this evening for our formal meeting week, and the convention continues tomorrow. We look forward to the next few days talking about where we've come from as an organization, where we are, and where we ought to go. Again, thank you all so much for following. God bless you all. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And just uh, as we close, we want to thank everyone who made it possible. Uh, the outgoing Vice President, Mr. Pio Beza, who also extended some gadgets here to make this possible, Cyrus McGee, who's representing KMTV. Uh, one thing I want to quickly say that I know a lot of you out there in Liberia looking forward uh, to being with us tomorrow during the events. Of course, it will be going live. But hopefully next year, uh, this pandemic may slow down and the American ambassador will open up and some of you will be here in person. Um, so just keep faith and keep praying for the world to be a better place. Again, we want to thank you for taking up your time. We know that we will gather one day uh, together. Again, thanks so much for everything you guys have done in Morovia to the team there. Oh, Emmanuel, back at controls. Thank you. Thank you too for what you've done. Thank <laughs> you.